because who wants to <laughs> try it? We, we might run into some problems, so we should figure that out. Um, I mean, it's certainly, we, I don't think we've done a, a huge amount of work kind of socializing and, and documenting all of the various facets of it, so um, <coughs> there's probably some work to be done there. I, I think that um, detecting build breaks might be a problem because uh, currently you get the, I believe that I fixed it so that when you do the lint kernel, you can get all the modules built. Mm -hmm. But when you do a normal, um, unless you do a lint or a universe build, you're not going to get all of the, right. uh, all the modules. And so we might not detect build breaks, um, and that could be a problem. Um. Yes, yeah, so what actually is the logic for not filling the red ball? Uh, The logic for not loading them by default. No, building, just building by default. Oh. Um, yeah, so the logic for not building them by default was that they were considered experimental features. Is that still true? To be honest, I don't think it is. That was um, that was in the run-up to um, FreeBSD 11. Okay. And they were experimental in FreeBSD 11. <clears throat> and there was, none of them were in a state where we'd want to say they were officially supported in previous D11. As of previous D12, they should have they should have actually switched probably from being experimental to full features, and we should probably switch the defaults for what gets built. So I guess a, a caveat into there is that um, a lot of, I guess, uh, more edge case and nuanced things that live in the in the current previous default stack kind of got, uh, I think, omitted from the rack stack, so it's not necessarily a drop-in replacement for all workloads. Um, but that's not, there's no reason to not build them. Build them by default. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying we need to switch our default stack, but right. building them by default and maybe making it easier for folks to, to do more testing, if you're open to having more testing feedback, you might, and also to avoid the build breakage, yeah. it might be yeah. a... Yeah. Yeah. The, to avoid the build breakage, I think, is the big, uh, would be a, a nice one. The, the other, you're committing that tomorrow, right? Sure, right after all the other stuff that's in my backlog. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> that one might actually be easier. Um, okay. But um, the other, uh, uh, the thing about the, the nuances that Lawrence was highlighting, um, it's true that the rack stack doesn't handle all the features, but I think that when it knows you're trying to use a feature it can't handle, it fails back to using the default stack. So it is, should be relatively safe to deploy in most cases. Yes. <laughs> with, with an asterisk, but we can use that. Uh, Rob and Nepti. What, what's the RFC status of Rack and BDR? <coughs> Are those both still in experimental draft? Uh, so BDR is still, it's not even experimental draft, it's just a Draft. draft proposal. Uh, RAP, I believe, is standards track or going to be uh, at some point. Can you see? Okay, I can't find it for the RAP. It may not be standards track yet. For it may still be technically experimental. Um, well, even if it's experimental, it should be in the data track. Is it, is it the draft? Are you talking about RAP or BBR? No. RAP. Rack has passed drive draft status. It's, it's been taken, it's been adopted by the TCPM working group. It did a working group? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So TLP got folded into the Rack um, document, I believe. So TLP and Rack are, are now part of the same thing. Proportional rate reduction, I think, is still a separate thing um, and is its own experimental RFC, I believe. I don't think that's considered standard track. But Rack is well on the way to being a standard track. Microsoft have fully deployed it, I believe, as of somewhat recently. Um, all of the main stacks are made. It's the default in Linux, too. The default in Linux, yeah. Okay, so uh, you know, I believe they've got plenty of implementation to put an experience with it now. It's just a matter of, of time, uh, no pun intended, uh, before it becomes a standard track thing. Yes, yeah, uh, uh, now do this next. I have the draft the words draft IETF TCPM rack. And it, it is there. Um, I see an 05 of it, but that's still draft. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the I mean the document has been updated in ages the Google folk, I think. Thank you. It, when was the last update? It was like quite April, a while ago. April 26, 2019. Oh. I've done a I've done a recent update then. Cool. I guess that's to keep things speaking. Yeah. So it's 
it's okay, so it's still a draft thing. Oh, my apologies. It hasn't made it to experimental RFC status. Uh, I do. Can I use multiple stacks simultaneously on different copies? Uh, yes. Uh, <coughs> yeah, so uh, there is a kind of what is the default, um, the, the internal default gets very little bit, but there is whatever the system will use as its default stack if nothing, no application explicitly represents it. Um, you know, it could be the FreeBSD stack instead of the Rack stack or anything else. And then there is a socket option you can use to say, please switch to, and this hand when you go into the stacks, it goes, at whatever time I get asked to switch to me, is this state of the universe okay for this connection prior, you know, for has been doing the handoff? Um, is, is the state that's incoming, is it acceptable for me to switch to? And then uh, assume that's all good, it will return okay, or an error number if it can't do the switch. So it works even for the same topic. Yes. So this, we, we, we do this in Netflix. Um, so we have a system default that's kind of about hard and test and then we have, say, DCP stack testing will switch by side option from the web server uh, to, to the experimental stack and then use it for doing PD testing and other things. And is that whatever the working socket is, new connections compared to the working socket? I don't believe we do that currently. That we can talk about doing that. Listen socket, we don't attach a particular stack to the listen socket and inherit that part. Well, only by setting the system default, we don't, we don't explicitly do that in the listen socket. It is supported, and we've tested it, but we just don't choose to do it. Who would set it to like a system turn that on or something? It's a system that will change what the default stack is for the whole system. Yeah, but I'm confused. You said you could support it and just don't do it in terms of. Tom's question was about setting it for a fair Yeah, if I look at the listen socket, socket, could an application use the socket option on the listen socket? Yes. And then when you call accept, the socket can like from accept what stack does it use? Whatever you have in the listen socket. It doesn't hear it. So it does work. Oh, okay. Yeah, and we tested it. Makes sense. it. We tested it and it works. We just have chosen to. Oh, that's like the chosen to not use that and allow your listen sockets to use the default. Yes, exactly. Okay. But, but, we, we, but we have tested it and it does work. Okay. And I forgot we tested that, so. <laughs> um. Yeah, so that's, if there are any more questions, uh, that's the status and a bit of a background for those of you who are familiar with the rack stack. Um, Internally, we've got a bunch of small developments around things like TCP fast open and a few other changes that we haven't deployed as our sort of production default stack yet, but we will in due course uh, be testing and hopefully rolling out um, to, to take advantage of those, well, to at least have those features deployed. Uh, and uh, you know, as soon as we've tested and are okay with it, we're, we'll be releasing it, um, just pushing that to the, to the version that's in the upstream for this year ago. Um, we've been trying not to push anything to upstream for this group where we haven't put through uh, significantly large uh, AV tests on our own, so that's why it's, uh, I think there's been any new updates for a while, we haven't actually switched our production version of Rack for a while um, for the various <coughs> internal reasons. But, uh, I do feel like the Rack and FreeBSD is a bit stale compared to your production Rack. It probably is. I feel like it's been a few years a non trivial change in our questions are rapid previously. It's been a few years since we've had non trivial changes in our code, too. Uh, okay. It's, uh, um, we, Randall makes regular tweaks, but they've mostly been around things like uh, TFO support and uh, some corner cases around like SIN retransmissions and persistent and things like that. Um, and uh, for a number of those, for some set of those things, he's actually made the changes upstream first and then pulled them back into our stack. Um, in other cases, he's made them internally and then later pushed them upstream. And so there's cases where FreeBSD is actually a little bit ahead of us. Uh, but there's uh, the bulk of the, I think the bulk of the development work has um, subsided because it's reached a point of relative Stability. Having said that, I agree with Lawrence that we haven't 
recently made sure that we've reached a point where everything we are we've used and tested internally is upstream. Uh, it may very well be that's the case. I just don't think any of us have done the, the diff to verify that. Right. So. And sort of another piece of this conversation uh, is the DDR stack, which we're going to talk about now briefly. And then, so uh, just backing up for a second, uh, BDR is a uh, congestion control, congestion avoidance algorithm that um, Google published, I think, towards the end of uh, 2016. Um, it was sort of had a novel um, aspect of the way it, it sort of approached the congestion control, uh, you know, dealing with packet loss, trying to interpret info what the network was doing. Uh, so they published a paper, they released code, they switched pretty much all of their internal uh, systems traffic to running BDR, and then progressively deployed it publicly on the internet. YouTube now is uh, serving a uh, majority, if not all, of their bits uh, using BDR. Um, anyway, so about the time the paper was published, uh, we kind of looked at it and thought, you know, it smells interesting, looks good. Um, face of it, we started an implementation effort. So uh, Randall took uh, what was the rack stack at the time, essentially, literally copied it to new file BDR.c and began developing the congestion control on top of what is now an entire TCP stack. So the condition to run the TCP stack is, is mixed together and that gave you know, a bunch of effort uh, in the short term just for speed of development and so, um, keeping our, uh, the, the kind of production rack stack in its own little bubble. It gave us some easy ability to do uh, various forms of testing. Uh, true. Sorry, before we get too far into the DDR, Randall Scott being said to be in line currently, he's got a differential upgrade review for what we have just called VP1. Randall, do you know what he's got? No, uh, he's got a differential off for rack 19Q. 19, for, 19, for, for what we have just called it 19Q1. Do you know what the point is that I looked at? He does know the name. Okay, what about that was the thing? Sorry. Oh, okay, so just to repeat, um, Randall's. Uh, listening in remotely, and was just pointing out that he's got a fabricator reviewer that brings the version of Rack in the FreeBSD upstream uh, repo up to date, or very close up to date with uh, what we've got. Uh, not deployed in production, but we will be hopefully deployed in production in not too distant future. 1987 Asia. 19... 8, 7, 8. 19, 8, 7, 8 is the fabricator review. Um, okay, so uh, back to the So uh, basically, looked interesting. We went off and started uh, implementing it. Randall's done the majority of the development work on that stack to date. And uh, that started, I guess, towards just soon after the paper was released, and thinking that, well, this assuming that it delivers all the benefits that Google have claimed. Um, this will hopefully be a, a nice thing for us to eventually switch over to running and, and deploying. And unfortunately, life hasn't turned out to be quite that simple. Uh, so we still haven't uh, deployed it in production, but we have been doing a lot of production testing with it and trying to understand its performance characteristics and the dynamic behavior differences between it and the, the rack stack that we're using uh, right have you guys updated to BBRV2? Have we updated to BBRV2? No. So BBRV2 was first presented at the recent IETF in Prague in March. Uh, there's no, I don't know, the code has been publicly released yet. Um, only the kind of high level changes relative to V1. So the, the code we've got is, we, well, we have uh, two things. We have a V1 kind of bug for bug compatible V1. And through a CCTO, we also have a Netflix kind of experimental, like, v, you would call it a V1 inspired uh, BDR. So Randall's done a lot of work looking at some of the kind of behaviors that we, we found weren't great for us in BDR V1. And he went off and did it you know, with a bunch of lab testing and, and real world development testing has made a bunch of significant changes, which 
we just don't really call Netflix mode. And it does things like, you know, not drive the queues out a bunch of uh, scenarios and, and is generally a little less aggressive at inducing packet loss and other things that uh, BDW1 can be prone to doing. Um, so we've kind of been looking at both. And in fact, uh, just this past couple of weeks, we've run a very large scale um, public test of the BDW1 mode code uh, against Rack, and we're having a meeting with the Google BDR folks uh, next week to talk about the differences we see in the Netflix streaming environment versus uh, what they see in YouTube and some of their own internal use cases to try and compare notes because we're not seeing uh, some of the quality of experience metric movements that they were seeing for when they deployed it. Um, so obviously there's a difference just in terms of the way the Netflix adaptive streaming works versus uh, versus YouTube, but also there's uh, potentially other things that we're missing. So there's, there's a bunch of no comparing to be done there. Um, but uh, anyway, I, I don't think we've upstreamed VDR yet. Basically, we didn't feel comfortable doing so until we could kind of with some level of assure, assuredness say this is VDR V1 verified, you know, with stamp on it kind of thing. We've, we've pretty much we've done a lot of internal work. Uh, so we have a transport testing lab uh, with a bunch of uh, essentially Netflix servers, the open connect appliances, uh, which are able to serve both real clients and just contrived download tests and whatnot. We've done a, a huge amount of work over the last, uh, I guess, six months, if not more at this point, to really using that test bit to analyze the whole thing under a microscope, the V1, uh, the V1 uh, mode under a microscope, and make sure that it's both about compatible with Linux VDR, looks, smells, quacks like. Uh, Linux VDR, and in fact, we've found a, a few points. So I guess I would call them bugs in the Linux VDR as well, but it's fed those back to the Google guys, which is actually a, quite a productive and useful exercise as well. Um, so having having gone through that effort, I think we'll be ready to publish uh, as in to the previous repository. Um, uh, the, 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 at least say what we would uh, call the VDR one mode, and say that the people have at it, go play with it. Um, so that's, that's hopefully in the not too distant future. And if anyone's like desperate to get their hands on it now, I think you might be willing to, if you're willing to take what we would still call development code and, and play with it, we, we might be able to, we'd be able to at least chat with you uh, offline. I can't promise anything. Um, we, we've done a little bit of beta testing with people outside of Netflix, but that's on a case by case basis. And, uh, so it's no promises. But, um, uh, Bjorn? Very small V60 drum and this experimental thing does put code out that experimental as a previous. It's not somehow that involved, but people can do it and try it. So you're saying you've got some way of flagging code? So we previously had as a compiler option like experimental. Oh, okay. Right. And people have said, well, we might want to do a time frame on R and I said, well, if I want to experimental, I want it all or nothing. Okay. So if people want to play with it, Always a way to shift the code, but so, not enable it by default. Right. So, just for the benefit of the people listening to the stream, Bjorn's saying that there is a, a yes. option in what source.com for something? Uh, kernel and source.com. Kernel and source.com for you can basically put things under an experimental flag and have it get built if someone's opted into all the experimental stuff. Um, so, I guess in to the conversation we're having earlier, I mean, once BPR makes it um, into the upstream of previous DB repo, I think if we're going to be building the rack stack, uh, then building the BDR stack is probably something that um, would make sense to do that. I'm not sure that, it, given that it's, it's fairly standalone, I'm not sure that we would need to put it up in an experimental point. Yeah, right. If BPR doesn't use this level of CC algorithm stack? No, and so that's something that we kind of need to revisit. So at the time Randall started doing the work, the modulus congestion control framework wasn't designed. Uh, it, it didn't have the appropriate hooks and mechanisms to deal with a rate-based congestion controller. And so going back and, and kind of figuring out what it needs to be able to represent something like BDR and then extracting BDR from the stack, from the surrounding stack into a congestion control module is something I would love to do. And it's actually on the cards. I'm, 
hoping that it might be a project for this year, but it's not. I haven't formally committed to it, uh, at least internally. Um, but it's it's on the cards and something that we should. And I, uh, I'm willing to. I, I will say we will do it. Um, I'm just not going to promise exactly when. Um, but it's definitely so. I, I guess in the interest of getting something out quickly, we will publish it as the full TCP stack. Uh, you know, take that as it take that as it is, and then with the intent of, of going back and being able to. Make the EDRA plug more congestion controller and have that ideally be usable also with, uh, well, maybe not with the defaults with the, the FreeBSD based stack, just because of the dependencies that exist between a lot of the infrastructure that's, uh, that was introduced in the rack stack for tracking individual sends for the time based retransmissions. Um, and then there's kind of a, a follow up broader question around, uh, like, a, ideally. There's nothing stopping that, in a general sense, having recent acknowledgement uh, in the base FreeBSD stack. Um, and so I think we have a, a, a conversation that needs to be had around, you know, the, the kind of the support model and what we're thinking about um, in terms of these very stacks being in existence and uh, how we want that to look in the kind of longer term vision. Because the, I, I have a personal opinion on the matter, and I know I differ on that with some of my colleagues and probably various other people in the room. Uh, I don't know if this is quite the right slot to have that discussion, but we might want to revisit it at some point. Uh, I have it down there under modularity second now. Oh, you do? Okay. So, there you go. so we will come back to it. Um, but, uh, but, but certainly at least to say getting rid of the BDR stack and having BDR be a pluggable module in the rack stack. Uh, would be at least a further baby step in the in the right direction in my mind, um, and then we'll talk about kind of the broader thoughts on how uh, we should play out at some later point. Um, I think that brings up today. Uh, we don't have and we have not seen a BBRV two spec and or code yet. As soon as that happens, uh, <coughs> our intention is to implement it because it does look like it does. <coughs> A bunch of things we've long lamented should be in should have been in the RV one. Uh, so, do you have a follow-up question? No. Uh, <coughs> I'm looking for the V2. They presented it, I yeah, but I kind of right. they publicly say it's revised revision of the draft. But I'm not trying. They, they, I don't think they they certainly haven't published a revised draft, and I at least well certainly I haven't checked recently. I don't <coughs> believe they published a revised draft. Yet, um, but it's you know, it's coming. Essentially, V2 for anyone that's interested. So, maybe V1 uh, essentially ignored packet loss. It considered that a not a valid, <coughs> a, a good indicator of congestion. And so, it essentially ignores it, repairs the damage, and, and motors on uh, based on its ability to try and infer what it believes the, the bottleneck along the path's uh, appropriate rate to be. Uh, it turns out that packet loss is actually a useful congestion signal. Um, <laughs> you know, particularly given that TCP has used congestion as a signal for longest time, so networks have evolved to give it a signal that it knows how to respond to, which is by washing it on the head. Sorry? It didn't used to be, but now it is. And so, BBLB2 adds an explicit uh, sort of conditioning uh, on loss uh, into the, into the uh, BBR model. It also adds uh, support for ECN, but not traditional ECN, and then support for uh, a newer style of ECN, uh, kind of similar to how data center TCP and various other things that rely on ECN work. So it's, it's a kind of proportional marking reduction uh, rather than an explicit drop by 50% of the ECN, ECN mark. So it's a more nuanced approach to interpreting ECN, and it looks like it has a very nice. Uh, Response there. Uh, we recently learned at the, at the ITF that uh, the Doxus folks, Cable Labs, <coughs> added uh, L4S support to the Doxus spec. Essentially, what that means is there's going to be dual queues in Doxus cable modems. One of them will be a low latency queue and will do ECN marking, and uh, for you, and they've got a uh, they didn't call it a traffic policer, but essentially they've got a little module that's going to be in there and making sure that if you want to go in the low latency queue, you actually play nicely 
for you to get in there. And uh, so BER in a low latency queue with L4S <coughs> is going to be actually quite an interesting development if that actually gets widely deployed. And I believe, based on the way they're implementing it, that it, um, I believe it's mostly, I think it's all in software. So in theory, if vendors pick up a 3.1 mumble uh, version of, uh, of Docs' firmware for their cable modems, then in theory they'll be deploying dual queue, um, the dual queue L4S uh, uh, behaviors on the, on the Docs, both on the upstream and presumably on the downstream if they're applying to this MTS. So that's an interesting development. Um, what else does V2 add? You know, they, they, they have an explicit model for the volume of the, of the path, trying to model the, the appropriate window size. That was one of the other things. So kind of the combination of all these factors, V2 looks like it's going to uh, improve a bunch of the shortcomings that we've, that we internally and, and a bunch of the IETF community have been kind of pointing out with the ERV1 as, as problematic directions. Uh, but having said all that, you know, Google are running it internally across their backbones and by YouTube and still like willing to accept the warts and all um, in, you know in spite of all these somewhat significant problems depending on the use case uh, so uh, but anyway they're, they're still actively working on it and improving it I think that's all I've got as an update um, if there are no more questions I'll hand it back to Jonathan Okay, the next item that I had on the agenda was um, hardware software casing. Um, this is one of those areas where I thought it would be worth at least getting an update on where things stand. Um, so I, uh, let's see, as of what, like a year ago, I think, uh, there's now a uh, software casing system in the upstream tree. Um, it's called the TCP High Performance Timer Subsystem, I think, HPTS. Yes, HPTS. What's that? Yes, yeah, sorry, precision, high precision timing subsystem. So the normal callouts give you, um, actually, the normal callouts should really give you higher. Can give you some millisecond precision, but the uh, high precision timing subsystem was meant to give uh, fairly accurate within a certain number of microseconds um, precision for the various timers in TCP. Um, one of the biggest one of the, one of the biggest consumers of that is the timer that says it's time to send more packets, um, and so that's how you can create a pacing. Uh, Create a pacing system out of these, and that's what uh, BVR will use when it's eventually upstream. Uh, Rack uses it, but not for pure pacing. Rack uses it for the burst mitigation um, at the moment. Uh, there's also been um, actual hardware pacing that's been implemented, um, and I think uh, uh, see Navdeep. I mean, you you can. Tell us if there's been any developments, what Chelsea has done for hardware pacing. I don't, I don't recall any in the past year or so, right? Yeah, not recently. But the driver parts are done. And there may be one round of tuning for specific workloads, but there hasn't been any major activities. Okay. Yeah. Is there anyone here from Melanop or, or another big vendor that's done hardware pacing? I guess not. Um, does Intel have anything with those hardware facing? I believe some of our hardware does, but we haven't had existing drivers. Okay. So now's a great opportunity to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's actually an infrastructure in place, um, and uh, uh, two vendors work together to hash out the infrastructure, so it would work across vendors, and so it should also work for, we hope it also works for a third and a fourth vendor. Um, so you're welcome to implement that and uh, try it out. Um, the, the nice thing about having it be cross-vendor is that hopefully 
It doesn't require modifications of upper layers, um, and you just can add the support to your driver and it will uh, other, um, uh, anyone who wants to do hardware facing and just start using it on your driver. Uh, there's also been talk over time about uh, maybe trying to somehow integrate the two different pacing models into a single uh, a single unit so you can do hardware and you can do pacing and have the upper layers be able to be somewhat unaware of what uh, the lower layers are doing um, and so you can just get some sort of pacing. If Rod's a good question. Is, is there any desire to put the pacing stuff into hip lift? Is there any thought to that kind of um, Drew, did, have you thought about that at all? I mean, if this is this is a add-on interface that two NIC vendors have implemented, I think it's a common thing that many NICs share. I mean, the idea of if you have to put things that NICs can share into if lift. We then thought about putting pacing coding into if lift so that any if lift driver could use pacing. The part that's in the driver is very driver specific. It's like parts of things that you put in if lift are things like queue management that kind of have a similar abstraction. But the part of pacing that is in like CHUB and LX5, none of it is in common at all. But the, the only thing is really the only thing that's in common is this thing. So all honest with you have to do is pass through. Yeah. All the things that doesn't deal with us. So the so you would need to have some abstract to pass through the pacing stuff. Yeah. And yeah. like wrappers for syntax Alex and three that thing. But it would be very small. Because it's really it's very the, the bits for like pacing is very big specific. For example, no one has to use a specific virtual queue for every page connection. We try to say it's pretty simple. So it sounds like there might be some small work to do to make it flip be friendly to this, but. Yeah, that's about if it. If Intel was uh, interested yeah, yeah. in implementing space, we would be happy to bring up and get those calls so we could figure out how to explain it. I'm also making some of the infrastructure slightly simpler, so it's a bit of two weeks. Come <laughs> on, I'll just give it tomorrow. This <laughs> is a bad week for me to be paying. Thank you. We go. Um, so there was some talk, uh, I think we, we think we talked about it last year at BSD Camp. There was some talk about trying to come up with a common interface so that we could do hardware and software facing. Uh, together at the, at the lower layers and just have the upper layers be able to express the fact they want casing and let the lower, some lower layer figure out what the best casing you can get is. Um, has anyone actually done anything further on that? Does anyone have plans to do that within the next year? Okay. Okay. Um, I think that uh, as long as there's no use case for it, then that's probably fine. But if we're oh, so, so, so Randall has something that he's cobbled together, which basically he, he kind of builds this capability um, array for different for different NICs, mm -hmm. so he can he can look up and see, hey, is this NIC I'm going to talk to? So PBR can see, hey, is this NIC I'm going to talk to? What kind of pacing does it do? Uh, right. What range does it support? All that kind of stuff. Um, so he's sort of got this common infrastructure to be able to the BDR to look at the neighbor for back and look at the and say, you know, what they do, which we need to talk about the south zone. Okay. Of course, it costs me no one to pay because we're all like, we have a conflict with the passenger. Okay. Right. There is definitely a need or use case for facing. Whether you ask if somebody is going to work on it. Yes, but that's my. the question. The, 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 but the question is do we, need, do we need some sort of unified interface that makes it easy for the upper layers or not? And um, the developers who are working in these upper layers are the ones to know that. Um, and if no one. Like if no one here has run, no one here has said, "Boy, I just wish I really had that unified interface to make my life so much easier." Then maybe there's not 
need to desperately work on this. So does the, does the software casing on the same second the socket option, like SR max passing rate? So how do you configure the software casing? At the moment, the software At the moment, the software basically exists purely for TCP, and it's all done by the TCP staff behind the scenes with no. But how do you configure that? Like, how do you configure? TCP is it the proper stack that the stack has to run and the rating is appropriate? Yes. yes. So, yeah. But we, but you could, you could imagine a case where you could extend this to work in the generic case and the user has a socket option and says, here's the rate that I want. Well, maybe the existing socket option is stored in a place that TCP can see it. Right. And it says, you know, SO max station rate or whatever it is inside the socket number or whatever, where I'm still be sticking it. I mean, I don't think you would change the interface. I think you would use that as a hint for asking what number bound. Okay. That's how I would imagine that TCP might interpret it. Like, I, I, I can and imagine using it as a way to because I'm thinking of past these cases that I've been involved with, right. you might have a pipe over something like a satellite link where you know what your upper bound is, and you darn well don't want to exceed it, but in some ways that could be easy. But you can imagine other like links where I know what upper bound is, and I want basically give you a hint of, you know, thou shalt not pass above here, but it's okay if you go below. Right. So, to... But I guess, is that, are you asking about, you're asking is there a common interface, and I guess part of my question is at what level are you thinking? I'm thinking for an application level, do they want a common interface, in which case I think the existing socket option is fine for that. It's a matter of making the software honor that. Right. If you're thinking of, so I guess part of my question is what layer of the stack are you thinking there needs to be a common interface to think about? Is that still in the kernel that, to think about, or is it something that applications would know about? Like, okay. So because of the use cases I normally deal with, the interface I'm thinking of is in the kernel. Mm -hmm. So TCP says, here, the TCP stack figures out the rate it wants to transmit at, and then says that I want to pace at this rate, okay. and figures out what it's going to do with the software. Okay. Um, so that's the level I'm thinking of. Um, I actually haven't thought about the user level, but that makes perfect sense, too. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, uh, and. Uh, it strikes me that that should be in the you know sort of relatively somewhat simpler, simplish thing way that should be somewhat on the simplish side to implement for TCP. Okay. But um, I couldn't say for sure because I suspect there's a couple of probably a couple of gremlin-ish kinds of things that you'd run into there. Because um, if, if you think about it, among other things, you have to wake up a lot more often to send packets and turn break them into smaller chunks, and that, uh, that has implications on other kinds of performance, right? Yeah. And I think it would be consistent if effectively the socket option is always a hint to TCP, and in certain cases, TCP is dumb. Like, the default stack is the crap. If the, if the hardware can do it, fine, otherwise I give up. Um, but if you have a TCP stack that is not quite as dumb, then it is only a hint for maybe a cap for a max, and then, then it uses whatever is beneath the hardware or not independent. In which case, we do need some way of having the hardware not always honor right. what the socket option is. Like, you, and maybe you said the dumb stack just needs to explicitly pass on the socket option down to the hardware one, hardware layer. Might be a way to model that. Okay. Yeah. The other thing Drew is getting at is that uh, sometimes the rate the user requests is not something the hardware can actually do. Yeah. So the hardware might, the user might say, I want 20 megabits per second, and the hardware says, I need 15 or 30, which one do you want? Yeah. Uh, and uh, there, there's various games that you can play through a combination of hardware mm -hmm. and software pacing to try to get close to 20, um, or you can just simply say, I'll take the next highest rate, or whatever. I think there's, 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 there's some... I think you just have to document it. Um, this is interesting. So one of the things I'm thinking about killing in syntax is there right now you can ask for the rate. You, you, or you can't ask for the rate. Well, not maybe you see. An interesting approach to that might be you set a rate and you get to ask what rate you got back. We don't currently let you do that. So you can do a set and see what you actually got. Okay. If we define semantics such that we will give you something no higher than what you asked for, but it might be lower, and then you could you could reuse the same cycle option as we get instead of a set, you get back what the effective rate actually is. I think for a 
Yeah, you don't care. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to think of a consistent story that would also <coughs> have more, like, I'm trying to think of what would be a consistent story. Although I'm hard pressed to think of either use cases aside from maybe satellite things or something weird. Right. Actually, user is not going to perform this network on speed so that I can make it all break syntax. Why is it basically just discovering the rates that you can make so that it's easy? I guess we can discuss more offline. Okay. But I think it's useful at least to elaborate a little more detail on because there's a bit of range, I think, on what that, yeah. what that means. Yeah, I, uh, I think that. There's, we, we should have a bigger discussion about it, but it's, ni it's nice to know there's actually a use case that merits having a bigger discussion. Um, but we should have a slightly bigger discussion on what it looks like because there's, as I said, it's not free to be software based. And so there's, e there's even a question of uh, whether you'd want to do software pacing on a user without having them specifically say that's okay. Yeah. And to be clear, I don't currently have a use case. I have a historical use case that I no longer have. Okay. And you can imagine a kind of a replacement for what people might use to that type. Yeah. Right. Effectively. Except that you want a per flow type instead of a physical type you're trying to cast. I don't know what's right about in that case. Okay. Right. So with um, pointing out that the, the software pacing that we currently use is tied Right. Um, Linux, for example, has a queue discipline uh, that uh, which does its pacing, and so it's, it's agnostic to the transport of it. it. They also have support for now, uh, fairly recently, other support for kind of transport layer into which gives you much typically finer granularity and more control of the transport layer, which is generally good for to try to do something like VPL, which really cares about this kind of precise emission of packets. Um, but I guess sort of the It is, and that's um, 
So the, it, BBR does inherently use software pacing when hardware pacing is not available, um, or at least a, there's not a hardware pacing rate that's appropriate that's available. Um, and that's part of what Drew was talking about, where Randall has built a, a table of what the NIC supports, and it decides which rates it's going to use, or I, I think even if it's just going to fall back to software pacing because there's no rate that's good enough. Okay, the fact that this could actually be something you would do about give you the next, the next high or the next low rating. That's basically what you've done. The you know, PBR says, I want you know, 20 megabits in this case. So when you can't get that, it's going to get this. Yeah, so B BBR will have something kind of like this, um, but it's going to be very tied to the BBR implementation. And you know, the, my question was, we need something more generic, and should we be making something more generic as opposed to being very tied to the BBR implementation? And it sounds like there might be a use case for that. Um, anything else on that before we move on to TLS offload? Yes, go ahead. Uh, is there any interest in uh, interface wide rate? Uh, What's that? Uh, interface wide rate. Limit. Interface wide rate limit. Yeah. So you could have yeah. multiple interfaces from the same physical pipe, insert them in different jails or behind VMs or whatever, mm. and then limit the VM effectively to a certain point. Yeah. Does All this would work today also, but there's no uh, standard CLI that you have to be able to all right, so the question is, is there a need for an interface-wide pacing limit? So to cap the entire pipe at a given bandwidth. Um, does someone know the, does someone have a use case for that? Uh, and that did give the example of jails. So. Or VMs. Or like VMs. You have to VM, to VM, it sounds like. And we could probably configure the VM to have a cap. So does someone, does someone here know of a use case where that would help? It sounds like no, but you're welcome to ask the question more broadly on one of the mailing lists. I mean, the driver supports it, but yeah, if somebody wants to use it, there's no problem. All right, uh, next up is TOS offload. Um, so there is, uh, in this case, TLS offload means one of two things. The first one is offloading the TLS work from user space to the kernel um, and doing something in software. The second version of that is off further offloading it and letting hardware actually do it, like uh, a NIC, for example, uh, and doing inline hardware TLS. Uh, the reason why this is beneficial uh, for those of you that don't, uh, for, you, for those of you for whom it's not, in, uh, who haven't heard the story before, the reason it's beneficial is that in the case of web servers, it avoids a lot of kernel to user space copies to get data encrypted and back to the kernel. Um, and furthermore, being able to just offload the processing directly to uh, an interface saves further on CPU and memory bandwidth within. Um, uh, within servers. Uh, and so both versions of that are uh, potentially beneficial for uh, things that are have a very heavy outbound TLS workload. Um, there's obviously one company here that has such a workload. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of this work has either ended up upstream or is in the process of being upstream. Um, and I think, John, you're working on some portions of that, right? Um, sure. So, do you want to talk for a few minutes about what's going on? Just let everyone know what your, which data structures you're touching and they should stay away from and stuff like that. <laughs> sure. Something. Um, so let me collect what I want to say. Uh, first of all, I'm working on some part of this and I'm probably going to be working on upstreaming pieces of it, but it's actually something that many people have worked on over a long period of time. So just because I'm talking, don't conflate it with assuming that I've done a bunch of the work, some of the work. Um, so, as Jonathan mentioned, it does have to do with doing TLS and kernel. Another way to think of it, I, I think is how maybe Netflix thinks of it, but as a useful way to think of it, is 
it's a way to get the SIM file back when you're using TLS. Right? The SIM files are really just being using your scripting all files or something. And when you do TLS, you lose the ability to draw and then you lose the ability to do that because you have to do the crypto usually in the user market or something ridiculous. But you technically don't get to have the zero copy or anything like the kernel, right? showing things from the disk out to the left. And so part of the goal is to like move that stuff back and have a SIM file like uh, data model. Um, so the software stuff, stuff Netflix, Netflix pretty much did on their own and already exists. Uh, Drew has posted a version of that to Net like a year or two ago. Yeah, there, there was like a public post, you know, and I don't know if there's much traffic in the thread, but it wasn't in public. Um, one important dependency of the TLS work is it also introduces um, a new type of external net buff that it's an unmapped enough, so it doesn't have virtual messages, so the data is back in and has an array of physical messages, and not quite the NPHT, it's an array of fit adders. Um, uh, and certain, a couple of big drivers have been modified to make use of it, but it's a generic thing and has a way of falling back when it gets down to the model by the output if your neck doesn't have a capability to turn it back on, or turn it on supported on that enough, um, and it will kind of degrade back to a normal enough for you. But it's not a lot of work to teach a big driver out of analysis. It actually probably makes like some work, right? It's only like a four or five years old. Yeah. Basically, you just rewrite the amount of chain, turn these things into the normal experiments. But also teaching the internet to handle one of these events is not a big deal. Um, <laughs> I have to look forward to having these kind of cash. Okay, cool. When I have our current matches, we have Chelsea, and I think you've all done. And the last slide, I'm not that nice of a And they were very good changes. Um, so that's kind of one big dependency that's currently outstanding, um, and probably something that I'm trying to split out uh, and we'll be working on trying to get review and upstream on my like, own order of weeks. That's kind of a uh, roadmap. Um, but the primary work that I've been working on is taking this infrastructure for um, doing TLS. And the current software TLS, the way it works is uh, we've already had a notion in SIM file having data that's kind of reserve space in the socket buffer, but it isn't actually available yet to do it with when you've queued this IO to get bytes that you're going to sit on the socket, but it's not actually ready to be sent because the disk IO hasn't finished. Um, the software TLS makes use of that to say that we got the data back from the disk, but it's not encrypted, so it's still not ready. And then it queues off um, a TLS frame at a time off to a pool of worker threads that do whatever software crypto they need to do, like AES or GCN or something. Um, to re encrypt the data, and then once it's ready, then it just gets handed out of TCP that's already encrypted at that point, and TCP doesn't care at all, it's kind of longer. Um, the hardware version, we actually need to kind of send unencrypted TLS frames all the way down to the deck. Um, so we actually are reusing some of the same infrastructure that uh, Red Moon Team uses, where we're able to allocate kind of like a tag or a handle on a TLS session on the deck itself and tag packets as they go down belonging to this TLS session. Um, and then we have to make sure we're very careful to throw away unencrypted packets if they don't go to the right deck or do things like that so we don't leak data on the wire because that'd be bad. Um, and then when one of these handouts shows up in the deck, the deck driver is responsible for noticing it's a TLS and bus that's not encrypted yet and doing whatever work needs to do to encrypt it itself. Um, so I, there's a couple of other capability bits. Um, it is tested and works for a definition of works um, on Chelsea. I also got patches, I think this week, that I haven't updated yet. Um, where Melmax is updated, has patches for some of their gear to work with as well. Um, and after, I, do, I, mean, I think the general plan is to try to get this upstream and review the FreeBSD soonish, even the TLS bits. Um, I don't know if we're going to be able to upstream the software crypto or not, or how we're going to manage that, but there at least will be the hooks available. Currently, the software crypto uh, does not make use of our internal crypto framework, um, which I was not there to make a decision, but I mostly kind of agree with it, because I have another long rant about how I hate our internal crypto framework and trying to fix it. Um, so currently, it's actually using its own separate copy of Warren SSL and things like that. And they are pluggable modules. It's pretty easy to have it just plug into the kernel. The kernel itself doesn't have to necessarily ship with the crypto bits. We, we, we have those bits in the ports. Yeah, the Netflix ships in those ports. So we can make them available as ports if, if, if necessary. Yeah. Um, so, 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 so,
we have, we have boring, we have boring SSL for CPC and GCM and uh, Intel. Uh, yeah, the ESL library for yeah, the GCM. The ISA on this, uh, so as my own side project, I try, I might try to um, use this as a way to browbeat and help drive improvements in our internal crypto framework, so that it may eventually be more useful. For example, on things that are like x86. Although boring is written in C, it would also work. Any any questions? Yes. No. <laughs> And uh, uh, so uh, thank you, John, for working on that. And also thanks to Drew, who did a lot of the preliminary work on and that. Randall. And Randall. And Randall. Randall. So basically, Randall Drew. came along and made everything work. And it, oh, that's right. And then I came along and made, a little, made it a little bit faster and cleaned it up a little bit. And then John came along and he cleaned it up a lot. You can say that again for the microphone so that Randall can hear you. Am I on? Yeah. So Randall, Randall somehow made everything work, and I have no idea how he did it. <laughs> Basically, if, when I was rewriting it, if I wouldn't have known there was a previous version that worked, I would have just given up. Um, so I came along and cleaned it up and made it a, a bit faster, and John is cleaning it up for real. Um, so I'm here to talk about uh, NUMA and the network stack. So at Netflix, uh, we've been playing with a couple of different NUMA machines to try to serve 200 gigs uh, fully TLS encrypted. And I've actually been able to get 190 some gigs out of an Intel dual socket, uh, 16 cores in each socket box, and about uh, 175, 180 out of an AMD, uh, what is it, 32 core box, the four node uh, Epic. And the key to doing all this is basically to try to keep as much bulk data off the QBI or Infinity Fabric or whatever your vendor calls it like. In order to do that, I've gradually been trying to uh, teach the network stack to keep things local. Um, and so some of the stuff has hit the tree already. You probably have seen some commits in the last few weeks that add a NUMA domain to MBUS and to the IMPCB. And um, I've just committed a patch to, to do this handy thing where if you're doing a lag um, and the connection that comes down to the, the lag interface has this tag with the, with the new affinity in the mbuff, then lag can actually look and see if he's got a, a NIC port on the new domain that you want the connection to stay local to, and he'll send it out that, uh, that, that NIC port. Um, so the, the key to making everything work, which is the one thing that's not upstream yet, um, that's just how it always works, is I have some changes to uh, IMPCB reuse port load balance that I sent up for just a pre-review comment a week and a half ago or so on the transport list and got no response at all. Um, so basically, if anybody remembers how the load balance stuff works, basically you set up these load balance groups for listen sockets and a, uh, a new connection comes in and basically uh, it shards that connection pretty much equally to anybody who's, who's listening. Um, so, you, so you'll have a bunch of Nginx workers or threads for whatever your application is listening on separate listen sockets. So the idea is you don't have to have a master um, you know, accepting everything and then farming, farming the connection off to a worker. Basically the thing's coming in parallel and everybody gets their own list, their own listen, their own, their own accept you. So the changes that I've made for NUMA uh, are very sort of specific to my my uh, my use case, which is basically that what Nginx does is he and I hate the Nginx code is that he creates a master process and then forks off some workers and the workers eventually accept their own affinities. So what I did was I made a socket option that says hey, if I have an affinity set on my, on my process, and take this listen socket and filter things so that I only get stuff that's relevant to my new domain. Um, and I'm wondering, if, is anybody else interested in this? Would anybody else like to, to talk about this? Or is this just, you know, nobody cares? <laughs> So basically, I'm just looking for a way to improve this API because I know it's specific to what I'm doing. 
because it, it's I'm, it's something that happens after the, the reuse port stuff is set up. It goes and tears things down and rebuilds them, and it's kind of grotty. So I'm just looking for feedback on how to make it better. And that's about all I've got. So. Oh, all of this works on the passive open side of the thing? On the passive open side, yes. There is no machine to or anything on the active open or the initiator. There is not. That's a good point. We could probably make a make make some way to make it happen for for something initiated. But you know, like my my use case is of course the, the incoming connections. But yeah. Well, the, on the transmit side, is it, if you set the affinity for the entity of transmitting, it doesn't sort of work out for you. But the part about tracking MBUFs and NPCB is a So so basically, everything I've done so far is tailored to my workload. Uh, basically, when, it, when it, a connection is accepted, um, you take basically the, a few NIC drivers, like the Chelsea driver and the Mellanex driver, are smart enough to um, tag the, the tag inbox with the with the affinity of the or sorry with the new domain that, that they have affinity to, and then when you accept a uh, a connection, it's the same way that uh, you set the, uh, the the hash in the IPCB, you also set the new domain. And that's what that's what the service is in the domain. Yeah, sure. No, I just meant I thought you were talking about the dual for the active connect and the connect. And on that side, the connect's coming from the NG that's already established an affinity of pairs, right? Right. Right. And that's actually kind of the same problem as my as my listen socket problem, where you want to basically establish an affinity on the socket in priori. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I was just saying there's nothing to figure out. It's just that you want to have tools. Although it's funny because I've never thought about that, but the interesting thing is that, like, let's say you've got two NICs, one NIC for each new domain, which is kind of how you want to do things, right? Um, how do you know what you're going to be hashed to on the router or switch you're attached to? So that's that's kind of a problem, right? Everything I've set up, everything I'm I'm set up for is sort of following the lead of the the link partner and the LICP bundle that figures out you know where's this connection to go. Yeah, it's a, yeah, similar, a similar thing you want to know when you're using RSS and use the same duality. Right. Um, is there any awareness in the Black Ember allocators that they should allocate from the local memory? So Jeff has a patch um, to UMA that uh, makes essentially freeing something from the wrong domain super cheap. Which means that you can you can basically mark the MBUF uh, EMA zones as as NUMA aware, and then when you, when the zone is NUMA aware, then it will come from the, the local the local domain. This matters not just for the software allocation, but also for the DNA itself. If it has to cross, let's say, PPI or whatever. Oh yeah, exactly, exactly. So if the memory itself came from the local domain, is that what you have to implement it? Yes, exactly. It, it sounds like. Maybe this is just something that we want. I mean, there isn't going to be a big variety of your terms. People won't even know they want this. You know, right. This is, want this. this is something that's, just, that's hopefully going to be invisible in the background and makes everybody's life better. Yeah, For the outbound connection case, um, since you don't know where you're going to be hashed ahead of time, it almost sounds like you want a companion socket option that says, move my affinity based on the socket. That works great until you've got two connections. Yeah. I agree, <laughs> but I, I agree it does. But how are you? Uh, you almost want to hand the socket to another worker at, at that point, right? And that's kind of like user spaces problem. You almost want to, you almost want a socket option that gets the affinity. There you go. Just Jeff has a GitHub tree with a ton of uh, new patches. And one of those is a is a UMA patch to uh, basically be able to allocate most things as NUMA zones. So, so right now you don't want to you don't want to just go and say hey make everything a NUMA zone because if you do then you'll eventually corrupt you, you'll you'll sort of pee in the pool because um, what happens is you allocate on node node zero and then. You know, 90% of the time you free a node zero, but maybe five or ten percent you free a node one. The problem is now stuff will be cached on, on node one and it will stay there. So somebody in node one will come along 
and say, give me something specific to node one, you'll get something from node zero. And eventually it just degrades to nothing. But he has a patch to fairly cheaply uh, examine the, by looking at the physical address, the, pro the appropriate domain should be free to. Amongst many other patches. I think I've wasted enough time. So, if anyone has more comments, yeah. they should uh, get in touch with you. If anybody objects to me mangling the IME East workload balance, which in itself is a big hack, just let me know. Um, we have a break coming up in 10 minutes, so uh, let's see. The next item, we'll see if we can cover it in 10 minutes, uh, especially because it's from someone that's not here. Um, uh, Club up asked me to ask if anyone has a strong opinion on an architectural question involving um, the EPIC code, which is... Um, similar to RCU. Um, so you recall that about uh, nine <coughs> months ago, 12 months ago, something like that, uh, Matt C committed code to uh, switch a number of network blocks to be, um, uh, from being locks to being held or protected by epic constructions or semantics. Um, and the idea here is that you guarantee that the objects that you get will not go away and be freed until you're done examining them. And the way that the kernel tracks whether the object's still in use is uh, through the system of you entering and exit, exiting epic sections. And when you're in an epic section, these objects will not be freed until you leave the epic section. And at the moment, um, because the way this change was made was fairly mechanical, we converted a whole lot of blocks into epic sections, which means you're entering and exiting epic sections very regularly. Um, and that has a potentially negative performance side effect when you're talking about doing this many, many times over and over again on many different cores, and there's a single epic atomic that everyone's competing for. Um, so Gleb's proposal was, is, um, to lengthen the amount of time that we hold the epic section. And in fact, uh, because we just have a single epic tracker for all the network structures, the proposal is to extend it to cover the entirety of packet processing. So when the NIC receives a packet, it will get an epic section, and it will hold it until it's completely done processing that packet, and then it will exit the epic section. Um, and he thinks that this is preferable from a performance standpoint as opposed to having many, many different cores uh, competing for the same atomics as they enter and exit these epic sections uh, repetitively during packet processing. It's a very intrusive change. It's taking a lot of work. And before he continues to do a lot of work on it, he wanted to make sure that um, there was at least some sort of general consensus that this was worth pursuing in some way. So, yeah. Has he done any benchmarking or micro benchmarking to see that we currently have an issue? Yes. Drew, do you have that data? I don't have that data. But I do know that the paper profiles from um, the atomic he's talking about is that it's, it's not the right hook for you. Excuse me? The atomic? The, the, the atomic issue you're talking about is not the right hook for you. Okay. So. Um, so there, there are, pro, just to repeat this, there are profiles for, that there is profiling data that shows there is a real problem yeah. competing for atomics on heavily loaded systems. Okay. <coughs> yes, so I think you were next, Bjorn. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Um, so uh, leaving There's garbage collection that's eligible to happen. Right, right, not necessarily every time, right? Just right. depends on things. Um, but if, if we make if we make the epochs longer, mm -hmm. right, are we then um, going to have longer queues of work to do um, when we leave them? And does that have an impact on latency for whoever gets 
you know, gets assigned that work to do when they leave their, their epoch. And does that, you know, does that matter if anyone measures that aspect of it? So uh, I believe it's already the case that we only do the epic work once every tick. So it's tied into hard clock, and I think it's only once every millisecond, basically, that we even do the, we even consider whether or not we can do reclamation. Okay, so all this work is deferred to some other context running yes. on the tick anyway. Yes. Right. Yeah. So it, it may length, it may delay some of them, but it shouldn't create standing queues that are choppier. It's just simply going. It should be the same amount that is due every millisecond to be done. It just will happen maybe a millisecond later than it would have. But yeah, the right. Piles that makes sense. I was, yeah, I was, I was wondering if yeah, if one of the assumptions of my question was if that work was being done in line with, with exiting. Right, and it's not. Whether we're, we're trading off the overhead of, of entering and exiting with you know higher latency you know, for some users. Okay, I think that Jordan is next, then John, and then Doug. Jordan. So, I mentioned two people are on top. I think Chet is also the person to talk to. Who? who? Chet. Well, okay. Good. There used to be a commercial firewall vendor on FreeBSD, and they had converted this deck to use our ad blocks, mm -hmm. edge to edge. I understand Flex Hardware is finding all the I.O. control handlers and all the various tiny little bits that we can come in and leave. Right. Because if you miss one, you go kaboom. Right. Um, and they had seen significant performance improvements back then. Now, the idea to do this on FreeBSD was there before Epoch happened. Right. Um, getting Epoch in that direction seems something to me sensible. Getting Epoch in the direction of doing what? That is doing. Okay. But very carefully. Right. If I would have done the RM block change back then, we can't do that anymore because whatever happened last year happened. Um, I would have made sure I can switch between the models to go back and forth and solve bit by bit out. Right. Um, I think helping Lab is the better option now. Okay. So a plus one for Glenn's idea. Yeah. Okay. Can you John? give a little, maybe I didn't quite hear because I'm trying to reply to TLS things and the hack and be. Um, can you give a bit more detail about what kind of trade off? My understanding that we already, like, Epoch Enter, like, during IP output, is held for all of, like, device driver below. This is if you want to move it up to, like, the equivalent of TCP so it's not across multiple packet systems in the output, or by square, is he, where is he, where, if you want to move the, the Epoch Enter up to the stack? Uh, he want, on the input path, he wants it to be held from the time that the driver has work to do on any given packet until it's done processing that packet. On the output side, I assume that it would be from the time that you enter whatever the first socket write call would be until you're done with the writing. Um, it, so That's he, kind of impossible. He wants, to, um, he wants to hold it the whole the whole That's time. A, once you have SK lock, maybe you can hold it. Okay. Well, maybe not even then because we can still. Remind you, you can't sleep, right? And you you can't have unbounded sleep. Right, so you can't but like, you do a block and write on a socket because the socket buffer is full. So it has to be inside of that. Yes, it has to be inside of that. But, oh, okay, but that's my question. So, so like, effectively, socket, what when so the socket calls PRU send or whatever the crap it calls, it calls down to yeah. TCP. So that layer, so a few layers up. Oh, that's that's my understanding. I, I could have that exact detail wrong, but I, I know it's it, it's as early as he can get it, and he wants to hold it for as long as he can to avoid all of the okay. the all of the entry and exiting. That no, I mean, I mean one of the things I was looking at flag when I was acting on syntax, and I found that we were entering and exiting the epoch like three times nested in places that was just silly. Yes. Um, so. I am a fan of actually thinking about it instead of blind copy and replace. Okay. The, the other um, uh, the other subtle change that he wants to make to go with this, um, which he may have already made, I'm not sure. Um, he wants to change all the macros. So the macros used to say IMP lock or IMP info lock, yeah. and they used to actually be locks, and they're not anymore. And when you see lock. 
when you see R lock and you see W lock, it's natural for you to assume there's there synchronization guarantees there's that they're not, not actually there. That was a problem with lag. It made, it made it confusing. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's been a problem a couple places where there was a, an implicit synchronization guarantee, but well, not implicit, explicit synchronization guarantee, which is not there anymore. And he, he wants to rename all of those to be something different so that there's not the implication that there's actually a lock. Um, I think it is a lot of churn, but I think that it's valuable because it, it does, because especially when you have R lock and, and W lock, and the same thing that are completely unrelated and don't right. really block each other. Yes. Okay. I saw a whole bunch of hands. I think Drew was first. I just want to say this brings up one of my biggest pet peeves is the macros for lock when you're doing this kind of rather we get the upload code. So that would be not exactly what you're going to be really. Rather than having true locks, that makes Okay, Drew says he'd rather have he'd rather not have macros for entering locks. Uh, I think Mark, you were next. I think there's there's also a lot of issues. Drew's proposal or Glyph? Okay. So there's a plus one because it would fix another reference counting <laughs> issue, sort of, or at least provide a path to fix it. Right, and I think it just conceptually makes a lot more sense than using Yes. Okay. Bjorn, I think you were next. Yes. Whether I have enough weight on the argument, you know, TBD, but that's just my counterpoint. I'm going to throw that in 
So, so you're, you're arguing against what turning down the macros, or you're arguing no, 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 against no, no. switching well, the macros? What well, he's dealing with uh, making okay. the EPOS longer I mean, makes total sense to me. And my only potential concern was based on how taking this understanding of whether we plan on the center. So I'm in support of that. Okay. Uh, just the, the point about getting rid of the macros for the operation. For the ones that remain, the macros will have to change that. Okay. So, all right, got it. I mean, I, we'll, be, we'll be less of it to manage, but it'll still be that aspect that it will make my life harder. Son, do you have any idea how hard it will be for Juniper as a downstream consumer if we were to switch from macros to real locks? I don't know, Um, I'm not the best one to answer this. Steve might have some input. I, I think, as, as we were discussing before, I think 12 may end up being a force in the function to make us seriously revisit the situation Tax, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, with our old network stack, God knows. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it would be a problem. I, I, I think it's one of those things where you can't take us into account because um, we're going to be in a world of hurt either way. We're going to force people in Bangalore to be smart. So I, I think we're at our break now. Uh, yes, two thirty to three is a break. So uh, we'll take our break now and come back. At, you know, I don't know. We're, we're a little bit late, so it's three or five. We'll come back. Um, there's still cookies in the back. There's coffee. I don't see any soda left, but. Uh, Anyway, that's, uh, let's take a break for a little bit and we'll see what I have now. Okay. All right, folks, I think we're going to get started again. Uh, we have about an hour and 20 minutes. Um, and I, hopefully we have about an hour and 20 minutes worth of stuff to talk about. Uh, up first is... Uh, Rodney, I'm going to talk about uh, two things. One of those IETF and some congestion experienced, which is a draft. You can, it's in the, a link to it is in the agenda. And then the other thing was some in foo macros. And there's a link to two reviews there in the agenda if you want to look at them. So, let's get started. Um, this should be pretty short. I was invited to go to IETF 104 this year um, with a group of people that are working on a new congestion algorithm. Um, BBR is a new one that's been out. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, there's another proposal for, for some congestion experience. That requires IP code point modification. Um, we presented to the working group. We've been asked to come back to Montreal with some, some work fleshed out. We made a prototype implementation that involves some changes to a congestion control algorithm. Basically, you copy New Reno and make some changes to it. And um, that brought up my issues earlier about wanting to change the way that we do pluggable congestion control. Our current implementation lacks access to certain things that I think we should add some more. Evidently, BBR has some access things that it needs to get to. Um, there is also this issue about pacing and that it looks like the newer congestion control algorithms are all desiring, desired to have pacing of some form to be efficient. Um, the SCE algorithm that we were working on does not actually require pacing, but it performs better if we have pacing available. Um, so I'm just, I'm here to get feedback on some of those types of things. And um, if there's there's interest in other people looking at this work or getting involved with this work, they can contact me about it. If we want to dive more into what the work actually involves, I can I can go down that path. I mean, I've got slides if we want to do, but I didn't really want to represent the IETF talk on SCD. Um, sure. S the current congestion algorithms are mostly attempt to either, from the sender side or the receiver side, avoid congestion. BBR, I believe, is almost purely a send side 
congestion avoidance algorithm and then it tries to estimate bandwidth delay products and round trip times. Um, it still ends up hitting hard congestion sometimes. The SC implementations, what we do in the middle box is instead of waiting until we get congested, when we start to queue packets up, we start to emit a signaling bit that says we're, we mark, if we're 10% full, we mark 10% of the packets going out. When we get to 50% full, we mark 50% of the packet. I'm using a straight linear function. It doesn't have to be a linear function. Um, so that you get fine grain, high fidelity signaling of what the congestion that you're experiencing is. This allows adjustments of the congestion window um, basically on a per packet boundary basis. Every, every time an app comes back, it will have the echo bit in it or not have the echo bit in it so that we can increase the congestion window by very fine grain amounts. Um, there's a, 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 it's fully backwards compatible and that we can actually interoperate with all of the current stacks that are out there. We lose to New Reno and then it beats us, but we, we still operate. We're incrementally deployable because it doesn't, it doesn't mandate any changes any place and it doesn't, it doesn't harm anything. It doesn't do anything that current boxes can't understand or just transparently ignore. No, it, the changes actually involve both inboxes and middlebox. We're implementing it in all three. We, we have a middlebox algorithm and we have inbox algorithm. I did, I did an inbox for FreeBSD as a one day, two day prototype thing just to prove that it would work. Um, the middlebox actually had to be a one long because our um, FQ code was broken. And then when we tried to modify it, it, we actually saw that it had a bad behavior. So we, and um, there was another one. The cubic is, had some problems. And so the, the guys I was working with were the protocol experts. Said, that, well, we'll just, we'll implement that in a previous in a Linux middle box. Um, uh, I forget the guy's name. There's a guy that's done a lot of fixes for cubic recently. So they're hopefully some of them. Actually, I think one said I do know his name, um, and I sent him an email about it. There was a, the, yeah. Randall, I think, made Was it Randall? No. Um, Richard Sheffield has done a bunch of fixes. Yeah. There, yeah, there was, it was a Limelight commit that was an attempt to fix an unsigned versus signed that really broke it. And when you back that out, it's still broke it. And, We modify cubic in the middle box to implement the SCE signaling bit. Yeah, the AQM. No, the AQM. Oh, so that's not Uh, PA, excuse me. I am K. I'm sorry. Yes, yes, you're right. I, yes, I mix them. I'm not the protocol expert, so. Um, if you have any, uh, this is a slide There, there is actually there. Are, if you just look at the history, there is the limelight commit that was backed out, and when that was backed out, there was a comment posted there that, that somebody knows that this is still broken, but they're not certain why. Yeah, but hang on, that's conflating two different things. So that was for cubing the TCP conversion control, not for Codel and Pi, which are the AQMs that were defined in the box. I'll get, I'll get that information for you yeah, afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. More, yeah, we can take that offline. Any more questions on SCE, if we want to get into it a little more or not, that's completely optional. It looks like we, we've done some benchmarks, we've prototype implementation, we run a bunch of tests. It looks like in most situations we can do lossless congestion avoidance. Literally, we don't, we don't even have to hit CE marking. So my only question, there was, there's been a fair bit of discussion. L4S and, and some of the other proposed 
those uses to be CN bits. Right. Um, at, at least my read of the tea leaves is that SC is late to the game. Late to the game and unlikely to get broad adoption. Uh, but I. Okay. I, the, 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 cable, the cable company has already done Doxus 3.1 and that's rolled out in, in hardware already. Right, but in terms of the. Okay. Valuable feedback. But purely reading tea leaves, and I, I don't make that as a judgment call on either because I can spend a lot of time looking at them. It's just the, from the ITS perspective, I'm not sure that I see a Okay. We, we're, we plan to be in Montreal at 1 o'clock, and we're currently revising, revising the draft we presented and writing three more. So we're trying to move forward with it quickly because L4S is trying to go to working group. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I've got another topic about a couple of uh, some other IETF related work that came up that I'll call the IAN2 macros. This is IAN loopback, IAN multicast, um, IAN experimental that are the some TCP or IP address classification macros. I went through and revised um, the code enough that we are using those macros at least every place in the kernel that we should be. There were a few places that had hard-coded loopback addresses. Um, there were some handcrafted multicast detection and some handcrafted um, IAN experimental detection that went on. There, is a unpublished draft that um, will probably go to IETF at 105 to ask for experimental status on using the, the unicast addresses 240-4, 0-8, um, possibly part of 224, and possibly the 127, um, the upper half of the, the turning 127 into it like a slash 16. Um, and using everything above that as unicast addresses. There, um, the two reviews that are there, one of them is marked as do not commit. I need to revise that um, after talking with uh, John Gilmore, who's the person that's driving this effort, to actually make those an experimental flag, I think is what I'm gonna use, what Bjorn proposed, and go, if you wanna play with these, I'm going to open these up and make all of those slash 32s. Um, and I'm here to listening to feedback on how people feel about that. I mean, it'll be completely, you have to recompile your kernel to turn it on. And, um, but it is going to put us out of RFC conformance because we'll let those packets hit the wire, we'll forward them. Um, there's some additional user line patches we need. And if you're running port stuff, most of it's broken. Didn't want to understand an unrouting protocol, Damon's. Any of them have hard coded Martian lists, complain about these ranges. Um, any, any feedback or thoughts on that? And no, we're not trying to make the IPv4 address space last another two years. It just, it's not going to happen. <laughs> there's, there's, other, there's other more important uses for some additional v4 space. Um, carrier break nap is, doesn't have enough space. Some, some of the telcos would definitely like larger RFC 1918 space available. Okay to implement? Nobody's going to... Which was what? Let's go ahead and fix it. And actually, there's a comment from Mike Carls on let's clean up IAN underbar class that we still have. Yeah, that's the, 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 those just need to go away. And if people want to help make those go away, I'm all for it. Let's make them go away. There's 
Um, one of the points that brings up is default net mask. Yeah. When, you, when you type an if config and give it an address, we assume the net mask based upon the class macros. Um, can we just assume if you don't give it a net mask, it's a slash 32? Can I get a buy in on that? Well, you, you can't. If, if config has to, when you if config device, right, you have to assume some type of net mask for the IP address you gave it. No, you don't necessarily have to. You can make it fail if they don't get one. Or that's the other alternative. Yeah, return an error. Is that the better alternative? I think so. Right, right now, we, we default to class of, which is really bad usually. So should we just change that to being a fail if you don't give it? Because that, but that's going to break people's boxes. Yeah, it's going to change the behavior. Yeah, that's that's going to break people's boxes that don't have a net mask in there. In particular, it's going to break our default. I would install that and silently change to a 32 without knowing it. Right. Okay. I, I, either way, either way, you're going to break people's boxes potentially. And um, but it really not so good. Yep. Yeah. People buy into that. We're going to we're going to change the if config so that if you don't specify a net mask, it returns an error. I could also mentioned doing a, um, a phase in where it produces an error and produces a warning. Zero. Produ well, first we could just do a phase in that produces a warning that we could actually merge right. back and say that in in 13, this is going to become an error. Right. Is that a better solution? I'm okay with that. All right. A warning, put a warning to merge, merge it back and then change it to a hard error and, and, and head. Otherwise, the Even the warning needs to go in the release notes, though, because it could be a lot of scripts. Yeah. Okay. Are there any other IM class? The only one that I know of that is really there is if config defaulting to it. Are there any other places that we're using? I think in the first six also, we have some. Plus, okay. Did we remove from the base? I think so. Yeah, I'm doing that. The other thing you're going to have to do is remove the macros and then see if ports break. Yeah, an ESP run will have to go. Yeah, that, and that's probably the bigger worry. And I, the um, ion um, multicast. I mean, that's that's everywhere. That can't go away. Right. No, I th I but could, the class in particular. Ion multicast is defined to be um, ion under bar class D. No, <laughs> but I mean, I, it, there may be places in ports that still expect ion under bar class D to work. Okay. Great. That's all I got. Thank you. Um, do you want to do your thing next? You wanted to talk about high end LP. High end LP. Sorry. Yeah, actually, you should do a lot of things. I didn't want to talk much about it, but I'll talk about it. Um, there you go. Are you looking for it? Thank you. So, through Rod, um, I got back in contact with Salim after eight or nine years after having heard about this. First time. Um, I don't remember much of the actual implementation and the thing it's doing. It's, um, let me get it back. It identify a locator network protocol. What it basically does is it splits up your, and they are picking IPv6 only these days, um, your address into the network locator in the first half and the node identifier in the second half. And it's basically an alternate way to do routing and to do multi-homing and possibly, if you're on the mobile client, move between networks without using your connection. Um, Bruce Simpson was a PhD student of his and has done a powerful previous implementation 
He's got a Linux implementation that he's demoed to some extent at least, and his interest is getting the code, well, getting the full RFC compliance done and shipping the code in FreeBSD. And I promised him I'll at least briefly talk about it so people have heard about it. And if anyone's interested in working, helping, talking about this, then please find me and we can look into details. And otherwise, if no one's talking, the code might just show up in a year and you'll have to deal with it. So the two things they managed to do is, or Bruce managed to do is, he had very few changes to the default kernel, implemented most of the stuff as a module, and they are currently only changing get after info in user space and keeping the socket API at least in the first implementation so you don't have to change anything there. It's non-disruptive. Current implementations keep running so you don't have to recompile binaries or anything. Um, it would be not very intrusive. At least that's what I've been told. All right, so up next we have uh, what I call the second half of modularity. Um, so uh, first thing is this alternate stack business. Um, I'll just put in a quick plug for the FreeBSD journal. Uh, for those of you that are interested in learning more about um, what Lawrence was talking about earlier about how FreeBSD or Netflix tests code using multiple stacks, um, there's a FreeBSD journal article from October or November, I think, which uh, describes that. Um, and uh, now, thanks to the decision to make previous journal available for everyone, you can go back and see that if you want to. Um, so even if you didn't subscribe at the time, you can go back and look at that and uh, get a flavor for how Netflix tests their uh, code using alternate stacks and how it, uh, we think it speeds up and uh, TCP development and makes it more, uh, gives us more assurance that it's working correctly. Um, Lawrence said almost word for word my bullet item earlier uh, without actually having looked at it. Um, we need to figure out uh, how we maintain alternate stacks, what the support ex expectation is, how we minimize code duplication, and so forth. Um, do you want to have that, that conversation today, or is that a conversation we need to have another time? Are you shaking your head no? Or I was going to say we kind of keep pumping the discussion. Let me ask a question to get the discussion started. Go ahead. Given you have two copies of TCP specs in the kernel at the moment, how do you deal with the, if you, if you actually make a copy and then change it, how do you deal with the simple names and stuff that you don't get duplicates? Okay, so Bjorn asked, how do you deal with not having duplicate symbol names? Um, at the moment, we do that using some, you can use some rewriting stuff, which is actually in upstream FreeBSD. There's a, a build option you can put in a module saying um, rewrite symbols or prepend symbols, that's what it is. And uh, you give it a string, and it goes through your module and it prepends all of the symbol names with an identifier you give it. And that's how we make them unique. So during the build process, we build the, uh, we build the code. Uh, redo the symbols and then turn it into the KLD which gets loaded. That's not perfect, and one of the reasons it's not perfect is that it only deals with symbols, it doesn't deal with underlying structures. And so uh, you have uh, a struct rack info, let's say. Uh, if you have five copies of the rack stack and they have five different versions of struct rack info, um, the debugger doesn't know how to tell which one you're talking about. Um, and so it's not a perfect solution, um, but it does let us have uh, exact, dupl have duplicate symbols, be able to easily diff code between two different versions of the stack, uh, and have them coexist in the kernel without, uh, without anything at runtime blowing up. Uh, as I said, the, you know, the bug time, uh, the overlapping structure definitions is a potentially a problem. Drew, were you going to add something? 
Uh, just that. Okay. And also, isn't there something else that doesn't think that maybe, I don't remember what it was, but there was something confusing. Um, maybe, it was, maybe it was the debug instance. Maybe you couldn't find the debug installation, something like that. It's been a while since I tried to find one of these things. I remember there was some other hiccup. Okay, yeah, the only one I'm aware of is the structure names being different. Um, oh, I, I remember the other one, yes. The other one is um, there was a bug, which I hope we fixed by now, um, where we were extracting the bug symbols before doing the symbol rename. Uh, and so GDB had the wrong yeah. symbol names. Um, so yeah, that was confusing too. But I, uh, I hope we fixed that. <laughs> I hope we fixed that bug by now. Um, we just had the order, the order of operations blocked them. That's the prefix underscore sims. That sounds right. Uh, it's it's been too long since I did that. Copy to the symbols. What's that? You just object copy to rename the symbols. Yes. Yeah, that's the that's prefix underscore sims. I I did most of that development on a VM between Chicago and San Francisco. <laughs> So that means you actually do full copies of the stack every time. Yes. Um, so there, uh, the, the pieces of the TCP stack that do not need to be rack specific, um, we've tried to turn them from being static functions into non-static functions, so we can simply reference them from the TCP stack. Uh, but there's, in any case where it does need to be rack specific, then yes, it's a full. Uh, it's a full copy, uh, and you know I think that's an ongoing, an ongoing question for us too. Is how do we deal with, um, how do we deal with figuring out what should be uh, static and held with a particular version of the TCP stack versus something that's more generic? Um, because you know if you look at our use case. Look at Netflix's use case. Netflix is trying to keep the same TCP code running across underlying OS releases until we've verified that the new code works correctly. Um, and as much as possible, therefore, we want the code to um, do the same thing across releases. And when you have tie-ins to unversioned things, um, they can change underneath you, and that can change the behavior. And there's been a few times when stuff like that's caused a problem for us. Um, so I, I think it's still that's still a piece that we're we're dealing with. Um, but that's sort of specific to the way we use these, where we're trying we're trying to keep a strong versioning across uh, across releases. Um, I, I don't think that that's necessarily a general. A problem for the general FreeBSD community, um, where, where there's one one version of each stack. But if you're doing TCP development, it's an interesting uh, uh, interesting thing to think about. I mean, I can see the entire copy of the stack. I would love to run a full one copy of the stack again. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and, and you can now. Yeah, apparently I can. Including the security book. Yes, including the security book. Yes, Ron? Does, does it deal with nested modules like congestion control algorithms or submodules of the TCP stack? And how is that dealt with? Uh, where there is a call to the CC algorithm, it uh, it's already done via indirect pointers. Uh, and so those calls would still just work. And so you can have the uh, the indirection that points off. You can have the indirection that points off to the you could have the indirection that points off to the um, the module for the TCP code, and then that code itself can point off to a pointer that lives in another module. And the, the kernel doesn't care because they're not um, they're not explicit dependencies. The dependency is only there because you're following pointers, um, which are set up by the different modules. So they, they're. Uh, n nothing needs to really be aware of where the underlying code lives that you're calling. There's a load order dependency, though. Those pointers aren't going to get initialized. 
there, there's not necessarily a load order dependency either, um, because the um, the base uh, new Reno is built into the kernel and you can't get rid of it. So there's always a congestion control algorithm that's there. And um, there's, al there's also a TCP stack that's built into the kernel that you can't get rid of. Um, and so there's always a TCP stack there. And once and the systems, and so they get everything started. And then you can add more modules, uh, either congestion control modules or TCP stack modules. And you can't start with no stack. No, not at this point. We haven't done. We haven't gone that far yet. Um, so we, uh, I have a project to make TCP stack buildable as a module, uh, but it's not. It's not going to be built only as a module. There's at, at this point we, there is a hard dependency that there needs to be at least one TCP stack and I think one congestion control algorithm always defined. Um, we could probably do away with that in some way, but we haven't at this point. And so there's uh, there's still that assumption that there will be one that's hard code that's always compiled into the kernel and can't be moved. Um, yeah. I definitely want to revisit the uh, network stack as a module stuff that we had started. So it's, it's a matter of getting people to actually get eyes on it when the reviews go up. It was always the hard part. Okay, so you're talking about something deeper than the TCP like stack as a module, whole right? The stack, yeah. Right. Okay, do you want to describe that in some Somewhere. Yeah, I, I did it like what three years ago. I think <laughs> was the thing. So, so for um for for those who weren't here three years ago, um, um for Jennifer, we have our own network stack. The whole we have a lot, a lot more protocols. Why don't you come use the microphone? Yeah, so I can do that. <laughs> yeah. All right. So just to clarify, when you say network stack. Are you are you talking about protocols? Are you talking about hardware or both? Or what? What what's the level you want to go to? Um. Well, yes. <laughs> yes, we did. Okay. Um, yeah, sure that. Uh, so for um, for Junos and, and, and specific, specifically at Juniper, um, we've had a network stack that has what well, started out at the 2.2. something days and pulled in stuff from four and things from six and pieces from seven and eight and um, probably more than that nowadays. But uh, for us, we have different ways of dealing with the interfaces. It's a hierarchical method. So instead of the IFNet structure, you have four levels. There's an IFD, which is the, the actual physical device, an IFL, which is logical, an IFF to deal with family, and IFA for, for the address. And so uh, we can't, we don't, we don't have an IFNet structure at all. These hierarchical uh, interfaces are how we handle things. So um, we need to be able to use the the Genos network stack, but we wanted to be able to reuse the the NIC drivers for from FreeBSD with well, we, the, the, the goal was to not have any modifications, right? And uh, so the the way that we dealt with that is there was an introduction of a thing that was called the the DRB API, and it was uh, to give accessor functions to the IFNet structure, and. So the that some of that code went into FreeBSD, but I think a lot of that has kind of backed out some over time. And so there's there are a number of places in FreeBSD that are still doing that are now once again accessing the IFNet structure directly. Um, so for us, we in order for us to be able to reuse those network drivers, we needed to have an abstraction layer between the network stack and those drivers. So that DRB API was that, that bridge. And so now we want to be able to then also be able to use the FreeBSD network stack or the Juno's network stack as however we see fit. And so we use the FreeBSD network stack right now for the installer and things like that, but then we'll use the Juno's network stack for the, the regular runtime. So one of the products that I worked on was being able to sort of rip that whole, pull the network stack out as a module. Um, it's not a module that you can KLD load afterwards, it has to be preloaded by the loader or however, whatever I need to do. Um, I'm working on some things to, to get rid of that restriction. But uh, it, it is the whole network stack. Um, the, about the only thing that you end up having by default if you say I want network stack capabilities is there's a piece that deals with interfacing between 
Um, some of the common pieces, like the jail code, and um, I think it was having to do with uh, FS mounts and things like that. So there's a there's a an abstraction layer there, and the um, Unix domain sockets didn't really need to be pulled out for us, so we didn't we didn't pull those pieces out. So you could have a, a piece that doesn't have an R stack at all, or you can have a piece that has the the at least the Unix domain sockets, but then has all the interfaces capable for you to be able to load it as a module um, via the network stack. The eventual goal for us is we'd like to be able to break that down even further so that you have a core, the base piece of the network stack that supports the different protocols, and then each individual protocol then would become a module. And that, that kind of falls more into the, the line of having a TCP stack as separate modules and having individual ones. Um, my pie in the sky long-term goal is to be able to have complete, full, um, distinct um, versions of network stack loaded at the same time, and have your application be able to switch between them as needed. And the, the goal, that's more of an intention of, um, for like a lot of things like universities doing development on new protocols, or people trying new versions of their network stack, they could have one that they know works, and have the default system use that, and then their experimental be over on another piece, and then have a few applications use that. So we're not we're not at that point. We're only at the point of being able to preload either one network stack or the other. But that does work, and it's been um, patches have been floated to Fabricator. I think what about was it about four years ago, three years ago, something like that. I think it still works with Juniper. So yeah, that'll be three years, three yeah, plus years. At least three years ago. Um, so it, and it started way well before that. I think it was probably about six years ago was the first set. Um, but it was one big patch at that time, and, and so people said, hey, can you break this up? It's kind of hard to digest, and so we did. Um, and they're probably still kind of floating on Fabricator, but it never really got that many eyes. So I think we had a limited set of some of the patches went in. But I'd like to revisit it again and uh, get those changes, get some sort of level of the changes in. But uh, there, there's more of a discussion that needs to be had about how people really want to handle it. And I know that Gleb had concerns about the DRBA guy and the fact that you have to take those function call overheads for a lot of the accessors into the IFN structure. There's, there's ways around that. It, it, like we can make a lot of those accessor functions um, potentially in lines in, in, the, in a header file. And so you could include that header file in a .c, which would compile those as real functions that would then make it available to those that aren't doing the inline version. And anybody who wants the inline could just include it with like a pound find that says, yeah, I want the inline ones. So that, I think that's a, a, a reasonable compromise that can be done, but I think there's more discussion that needs to happen there. I, so Drew can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, we've been doing indirect function calls for TCP input and output for year, several years now. I don't think we've seen any noticeable performance set from that, have we? Yeah. So at, at least on Intel x86, yeah. it's, it's, it's not like you know, we're doing tens of millions of this a second. We have our own PSM, so not. Uh, so you think there'd be more from what he's proposing? There, there is an alternative. Okay. <laughs> the alternative is to get rid of IFN and do the break up into IFD, IFD. Sure, that's there right. is that. We've, we've had a discussion a number of times at BSC CAN and other places about trying to do that sort of functionality of the hierarchical interfaces. And, and what's the argument against it? Besides, there isn't an argument against it. It's a matter of getting people to sign up. Yeah, it's, it's a matter of the fact that he's, um, uh, we must have brought earlier, if we were going to do the work again, um, Dennis Ferguson actually wanted this to go further. Um, so we, our IFL has larger and larger over time. And, and he was here, what, that was the three years ago, right? He was here when we were yeah. talking about it. Um, yeah. And uh, we, we actually have situations where we really like to be able to stack IFLs on IFLs on IFLs for all sorts of things. Um, so there's, there's potentially some further breakup that, that would be beneficial. Um, uh, unfortunately, the new network stack that he was going to do all that work in has, has, has gone off to that on his own. That would probably take a while. Yeah. It'll probably be a decade or so before it shows up. So that, that was uh, Simon Geary talking in case we didn't get it. I don't know if people are listening. So um, <laughs> he's talking about Dennis Ferguson uh, 
had an idea for new networks back and, and has been working on it and is still working on it. So who knows when that will. But basically, doing the, 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 the structure breakup would uh, largely eliminate the need for the, the access functions that we were speaking about. True. Yeah. If, if the, well, m maybe. <laughs> Most likely it would, but uh, um, there's still the, it, it's, as long as there's that clear delineation between the things that the, the hardware side, the driver side needs and what the network stack needs. And some of that's been broken up, I know Cliff did a lot of work on that um, with the driver structure. So, so going back to the, the first proposal um, where we have the accessor functions, um, Drew, were you, do you, do you think we're gonna have more of those or do you think it's gonna be the same the same scales we have with TCP right now? I'm just trying to think on input and output, how many times we hit we hit these things, so I suspect it's gonna be slightly more. Okay. Do you, um, intuitively, do you, are you concerned about overhead from this? I'm not concerned for us, I'm concerned for things like the Olympia Packet Football that we're putting. OD is what? Like, like you know, the, something like like a packet, like like a high packet per second would work. Okay. Like if we're doing DOS or if it's um, yeah, really packet forwarding with those. Yeah, I was figuring like if you have if you have that capability of inlining it or not, then you could do something like um, if I include the network stack in my kernel config, then you would take the inline versions of things, and if you weren't doing it that way, you, you could either build your modules to say, yeah, I want the inline version, or I don't. And if you, you don't, you would, you would normally probably take the inline version. And if you're not carrying, if you actually want to be able to do the modular network stacks and have potentially different ones loading, and then you would, you would most likely want to just say, yeah, okay, I'll, I know there's going to be an overhead hit, but I'll take it because I want to do this. And it's more of an experimentation side of things. But we, I mean, we, we do it in Junos, and we haven't really seen that much of a problem with it. Yeah. Bjorn, did, uh, I, I know back when we were talking about doing the TCP modularization, Robert was concerned about function overhead for the indirect calls. Do, do you know if he did any analysis of that and what the impact was? Yeah, no. Okay, so it, it never went from, it never went to a hard concern based on data, or, or there was no experimentation that showed it was a problem that you saw. I wasn't here three years ago. Yeah. So I phone from the page and it says, need to ask be said, okay, I'm here, you can ask me this year. <laughs> <laughs> it also says slides available and stuff. Um, I in my private demo world, I'm someone who likes to get rid of IPv4 or has gotten rid of IPv4 for himself mostly uh, a long time ago. I would love it to be loadable. Like, you know, right, that would be the next stage. That, that's yes. where I, because because for us, we want to be able to do the, do something like uh, okay, we have different implementations of protocols in in the GNOS network stack, like um, ISIS and some others that aren't in yeah. previous yeah. network stack. But we might want to take the previous network stack implementations of TCP, right? And so if those were actual models that we could load. It makes it a lot easier and and easy to easier to upgrade them if we need to. I mean, that's I I have the the ideas in my head to do it, and I had started down that path, but um, you know, other things <laughs> had taken my time. Yeah. So I, I have start, I have started that, and some of the code is there, but it would probably need to be updated to the current. Mm -hmm. But that, yeah, that's my eventual goal is I want to be able to make every single protocol be able to load as separate modules. That was a feature of uh, Dennis's new stack, which was you can introduce new protocols. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah, that was one of the goals. To some extent. The you can hook up like a few extra protocols. Yeah, but if you, if you look at the current yeah. network stack, things like multicast and all those sort of things, they're all works on the side of yes. the stack. Right. So in, in this new design, they're all first class citizens. Yeah. Yeah, and part of the thing, part of the, the thing of being able to load the network stack at runtime after the system is booted will will resolve some of the issues that are that are there for being able to make a protocol loadable as a module individually. Like the domain registration for one is, is a hard one. That right? When you first proposed this, did we have a network and a transport working group that met on a regular basis? No. Not that time, no. So 
so and at that time the game the big gaming issue from my understanding was was nobody wanted to review it to sign up to help get it pretty much well let's start bringing this up at the transport meeting and see yeah I, I, I mean I, I can rejoin them I haven't I hadn't had time for a while so I kind of dropped off but I was on them for what probably about a year or so that we were doing it are you on the other yeah. yeah I am yeah Oh, okay. Yeah, so I can start rejoining. We can have some discussion. About it, it's at an awful time Pacific, but a great time Eastern. Right. Uh, you right. Should... Yeah. So yeah. So I'll, I'll I'll see about adding time on my schedule to to actually attend. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Other questions? Quick question in the notice doc, which I'll just read out. Uh, what is the long term goal for the whole stacks? Keep both unified into one ideal design. That like TCP. Is that TCP TCP or is that for uh, what his uh, all stacks? No, I think it's well, all stacks would have been probably the TCP one, right? Yeah, but or the whole. Well, we should answer it for both. So you answer, I guess. you answer it for your proposal first, and then we'll. Yeah. So my eventual goal is to be able to have multiple versions of stacks being in in memory at the at the same time and being able to select which ones you have. Um, the challenge with that is there's so a little go with your Juniper hat on or a hat on? Um, a little of both actually though. Um, whether or not Juniper itself will uh, put the time and resources behind it, I can't really say. I, I'm, I've been pushing for it internally, but uh, it hasn't really gained a lot of traction about that. Um, so it's probably more the FreeBSD hat than, than the Juniper hat. In that case, but the the challenge there is we there's a lot of work that has to happen in the uh, user space tools. So um, one of the uh, Justin Pivens over there <laughs> and myself have had discussions before about um, and actually we do have something on our agenda to work on this year in Juniper is to uh, try to um, modularize the the some of the the actual user space tools like. Um, I have config and nest app, and so you can have them, some of the pieces more like, more as libraries and to be able to be loaded. And the eventual goal then would be that you could have an idea of which network stacks are, in, which network stacks are loaded and have some kind of identifier that you can then match with a set of libraries that you would load to know um, how can you configure those, that network stack and how can you get statistics from that network stack. Because you might have, and the same same could be true about some of the TCP stacks. Eventually, you might have some features that you would want to be able to configure with IF config, or to be able to get stats from with NetStat, which may not be compatible with one or the other. And so you'd want to be able to potentially dynamically load a library which would handle it. But that's going to be a lot of work that part. And that's that's one of those things. I think once we have an idea of how to um, make the the base framework for this and how the library should be written, then we can hopefully get some volunteers to start uh, helping out with that and converting some of the existing tools over to more of a, I know some of there's been some work to, to, to make things into libraries already with some of the stuff, but, but it needs to go further. Uh, you wanna answer? Or? Sure, I'll talk about the TCP side of it. Yeah, so the, uh, um, on the TCP side, we have the same sort of problem about stats, but we can just do it by making all the custom stats, specific stats pieces of CTLs, um, which is probably less than ideal, but it's better than not having stats. Um, and uh, having an introvert like Steve talks about would be interested in if you could load a library. If you then stack and learn what it's supposed to report, uh, and then the report the right thing, that would be interesting. Um, as far as the plan for unifying all the TCP stacks, uh, I think that's something we need to talk about. <laughs> um, pretty soon, once uh, the UBR hits the tree, you're going to have rack and UBR, which when you diff them will have a relatively small diff. Relative to the difference between that and the stack that's already in the tree. 
Think about it. <laughs> um, and uh, they don't have three full implementations of certain sets of uh, functionality. Like, how do you deal with how do you deal with the incoming packet when you're in the established state? There will be three different code paths to deal with that. Um, that will deal with it in three similar and yet different ways. Um, and that does not sound like a sustainable long term future to me. Um, I, I think that uh, we need to figure out how to address that. Um, but I'm not sure that I, I'm not sure that even I know exactly how to address that. Um, and uh, I, my, I guess my best idea of how to move forward would be just to try to figure out where there are differences and why there are those differences there and see if we can make more things be, make more points to add plug functionality into some sort of base framework so that you can try to eliminate the code duplication as much as possible. But um, I think it's going to be very, uh, very difficult to deal with that. I think last time we talked about this, actually now I'm going to think flashbacks to two years ago, I think. Last time we talked about this, Jorn said, I can see the code first. I can't tell you how to deal with code duplication until I've seen the code. Um, and you've now seen the code, so I don't know what your, uh, what your take on it is now, but um, uh, the code is now upstream. <laughs> <laughs> now you could have seen the code. I was just imagining in my head that you said that's going to be a third one. How are those things going to grow that wants me, you know, could we take that direction another ten times? They're not that big. But hey. Um, There's no reason necessarily, I think we can easily say there's no reason to have three. I think there's potentially good reason to have two going forward, but not where the second one is uh, necessarily a I don't know, slightly different set of features and makes a bunch of separate training. Yeah, I, whatever we come up with here, I think we want to avoid couple of traps. One is making it so abstract that it's impossible to comprehend and do anything with, and you're afraid to touch it, because that's no better than what we had four years ago. Um, well, we were, we were afraid to touch it for different reasons, but anyway, we were afraid to touch it, and we don't want to end up back in that state. Um, but on the flip side, we don't want to have gratuitous code duplication, because that's that just is an administrative headache. Uh, anytime you need to fix a bug, for example, you need to fix it seven places. Um, so finding that we have to find that right balance, but I don't. I, at this exact moment, I couldn't tell you where that where that's going to end up. But I think it's something we need to we need to talk about and keep working on. Um, And one of the people that could provide valuable input is Randall, and he's not here, so it's hard to have the conversation to some extent without him. Uh, but on the flip side, as Lauren said, we need to have the conversation eventually. Um, I, I think we should uh, probably make this a topic for a future transport call uh, and try to dig into it a little more. Put one potential model out there. I, I've kind of thought about it might sound like cycles and major versions would have, you know, pick some cadence, we then essentially try and switch the, you know, next next greatest to the current production. And, uh, and so we've always got an ability to innovate, but not get too far out of lockstep with what we hope to ship and then have to maintain. And that's a potential model that we can discuss about 100, 100 plus others, but um, put something out there. 
Yeah, that's one. Lawrence's proposal is to have two versions of the stack, one that is the current shipping version and one which is the innovation stack, and then roughly once a release cycle, um, promote the innovation version to be the production version. Any other comments on this before we move on? I'm sensing the afternoon malaise has uh, settled. <laughs> um, anything else on modularity before we move on? Uh, yeah. So yes. I, I, I mentioned, I think there was probably a change to the network stack being scheduled um, as in the problem showed up as a change in size of a structure reference somewhere in soccer um, age. This, so this came as a bit of a surprise and of course us having to have to unwind a whole bunch of changes that we've pulled in from upstream. Um, is that the sort of thing that's supposed to happen on stable branches? I'm going to answer in a different context. I think for 11, we screwed up a couple of KPIs and KPIs by people just merging their entire sequence. Uh -huh. And IPSEC is for example one of those entire things. The the three by JSEC was nice but merge was just not quick enough to go to current rules that instead of well, they established procedures that we normally do. But no one was loud enough so it got backed up. It got okay so it got back No no it didn't. No one was loud enough. Oh I see. I was going to say, if it got back out, then we'll probably wind forward and, and get back in. After so. like two or three of these things happened, I just. Yeah, no. 11 was gone for me. And I shrugged and let you just didn't say anything anymore because you can say it once, you can't ever see this. You can say it twice, you can't ever see this. And it just it happened. And no one else stepped up. And so okay. In those cases, if you see them, then at that time, I sometimes didn't see them in time, so the next morning or something. Yeah, unfortunately, by the time we saw it, it was months yeah. later. So what was the particular structure at issue? I, I didn't dig that deep. I, I, I just identified that something horrible had changed and we had no choice to get back out. I, I think it's um, one of the challenges of the developer is knowing just what forms part of the KPI and the KPI. Um, because and, there, and there's... And structures. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, but not not necessarily, because not all structures are, it's not obvious that all structures are actually used in, um, without significant digging, it's not always obvious which structures form part of the KPI and KPI, especially when you deal with nested structures, which nest structures, and, you know, you've changed something in some nest, some structure that's used as part of the KPI, but only as a nested structure of a nested structure of something. Well, they're not always necessarily cleanly separated Right, exactly, and that's what I was getting at, is it, it might actually be a worthwhile project to figure out a way to mark those and make it obvious what's part of the K, KPI, KBI, and what's not, so that um, we could then even put automation around it in like Fabricator, which says, hey, you change, you change something that's part of the KBI, this isn't MFCable, and you know, make, make a note there that makes it obvious. The other thing you could do is potentially add CI tests and stable branches that look for, uh, just look for styles of KBI structures and um, see if they've changed. Uh, but I, uh, I, I sympathize with the developer who committed that because um, sometimes it's hard to know uh, what, what is and what isn't. And I, I think probably what you highlighted is a need for some, some additional documentation or tooling one or the other to make sure that we don't break that going forward. Rod, do you, do you, uh, do you know someone who can do that? Um, no. Okay. I mean, there's, the skill set to know whether it is going to break KPI or not is not trivial. And it's not, I mean, you have a KPI. 
we don't have to agree. Yeah. We don't even have documentation on what we clarify as we, our KABI. The only time I've ever seen it done, done right was with Red Hat. Red Hat would actually have this KABI that's been like this. You're going to strip against your driver and you say, no, bad driver, you're using something outside of the KABI. And in the first place to start is with some basic documentation about what some of these things are, what to even look out for. I mean, mm -hmm. Release engineering tries to keep an eye on the board. They're not code experts. They're not all of them. They're not people that can just instantly go, oh, that's breaking an API and it's going to cause trouble. Sometimes it's obvious. You change, you change something that's like, yeah, we know that's going to cause us a heart attack down the road. But you, it, 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 uh, one is, the Linky page is 10 years old now, that pop up in. Are you actually keeping an eye out for GitLab version to stable when you're not in the release cycle? I, I yes, he is. Can't officially speak to release engineering anymore, but yes, I was. <laughs> Seriously, reading that was that was important because if, if it got broke, yeah, it got broke, and we we tried to prevent those Yeah, one thing I was trying to get people to say was after I got yeah. the release engineering was like. Can you make sure that all the merges to stable branches are kind of like cycle? As in, like, is there someone authoritative who can say trust? Yes, no. I mean, I, I, I would yeah. assert as a, as a, as a, a low effort first, first cut thing, you don't ever see anything that changes the structure and sys. Okay. Yeah, that's reasonable. Without going through some level of review. So that, you know, by default, Change something in sys, you cannot change it unless you go and get approval. So you make you put the onus on the person doing MFC to like to do the extra work to prove that they have broken KDI rather than going the other way. Okay. That can actually be a pushback to the review that should happen before it goes into sys that could mark it as API break. So if, if, if you know up front that this is going to be, a, you just mark it as MFC network. And then anybody can see that it should be merged. Hmm. This, this sounds like something that came up earlier, Sean didn't comment in previous survey results that there was huge support for the MFC commit right. testing. I mean, right, we, don't, we don't want to be maintaining this in a wiki page because that drops like immediately. Yeah, right. um, if we, you know, we should be able to enumerate these and we should document that in the form of a tool that runs easily for people. And so if the tool becomes a problem, the tool gets fixed with the updated knowledge, and then, you know, that's like a virtuous cycle, right? Yeah. Um, it, you need somebody to own that project. Yeah, we need to record the information, and somebody needs to own it, sure. But I think this is, it seems like it's dovetailing nicely into what could be a larger discussion about what should be in the treatment of that. I mean, I mean I've, I've faced this issue too. Like, I do work I've done that wasn't clear to me. You know, what is the API API and what is it? And actually trying trying to find the quote authoritative review was something I was I didn't feel successful at. I got to a point where I'm like, well, I've ran out of places to check in terms of expertise. And I'm just gonna go ahead with it and see if any fires start. And you know, that's not a great way to go. Um, so I mean, we, you know, I, I don't think I don't think that requiring us to find the right person at the right time is going to be successful on the whole. Um, but it seems like we should be able to let the machine do the work for us. Yeah, and it's not and it's not too hard to do that. I mean, because we can get that information from the work as well. Yeah. It, so, it, it's actually much easier to detect the fact that you know a structure has changed and just say no than to do a deeper analysis to work out whether or not that structure has changed. So if the default answer is no, you're less likely to do any harm. You, you may slow down you know, improvement to stable branches and so on, but at least you're not gonna do any harm. Yeah, right, I mean, yeah, we may be like, you may have a two-phase approach to this point, which is totally and it's also very easy to do for that, so. Better to do. And the tool is easy to do if you know which structures you need to pay attention to. Right. And I think well, that that's, yeah, that's the underlying problem. You don't necessarily know, you, you need to know, you just need to know that you're going to do things under sys, potentially. 
Right, they're suggesting that you but that's actually your best. You know, that's clear if you're dead. Incredibly wrong because they're private spectrum through a system. Sure. You will have a high false positive. Yeah. But yeah, you can start flagging things that you know that you aren't going to do. And you can't just look at size because someone can rearrange it. And that would be Yeah, that's just yeah. 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 so. The size is not. Yeah, oftentimes size, changing size is not problematic. Yeah, you, you, you can that's about your work and work and other too. You can't. CTF also has this. Yeah, exactly. We, we generate CTF from Dwarf, not the other around. So. Yeah, the work info has more, has more detail. You can actually pull that stuff out if you use something like the Dwarf. I mean, I think Redout pulls up it. Yeah, Redout will do it too. Yeah. You can construct something that is effectively fitting the relevant section to Redout it as your yeah. input. Because we had to do that, but we're doing that when we went when we did the big lift from going from 6.x to 10. Yeah, I go and check to see like what things change to be concerned about, especially with the network staff. Yeah. So I, I think that there's probably something we can do here, but we have to find the right forum to get agreement on what we should yeah, do. Yeah, right. Because um, it's going to impact more than just the, the network stack for things, right? So. John, what's the right way forward of this, do you think? Well, I'm always somewhat listening because I've been trying to do a little bit of something. Um, <clears throat> In general, when, I, when we kind of talked about this in other forums, part of our sense has been that we only actually provide KBI stability for certain classes of models. Network drivers is one of them, actually. It's kind of geared towards device drivers. Maybe file systems, like we try. Um, struct proc, we try. Actually, struct proc, we actually tend to do a pretty good job and try very hard not to break. But like graphics drivers, we dig into VM. They lose. We do not guarantee KBI stability at the end of the term. We just don't. So there's actually huge swaths of the kernel that we do not that we do not wish to enforce KBI stability. So I this is a very broad hammer. You may end up with a very high fault positive. So what about So going the other way, John, how hard is it to enumerate what actually is covered by KBI guarantee? So you're saying that everyone feels that that's a non-trivial problem. You could do it, but it would be. I think you would res we resort to doing source code annotation if you actually wanted it to be right. Okay, but you're saying there's large swaths of sys that we don't guarantee stability for, which, yeah, which like implies yeah. that it's a, a very reasonably small subset that we do guarantee stability for. So how do you uh, pick that out? Well, no, I'm not sure that's true either. Um, like there are lots of utility things that. So let's say you want to do a network driver. So that does include network for things like Instat. Yeah. It also includes like Mutex. Right. And I mean, <laughs> and Malloc. And like, there's a lot of crap that, or Malloc types even, that you there was Malloc declared. There's actually a lot of types that are utility things that actually fall under that brush of having the ability to load a network driver. Well, what about if you started with just like sys sys? Started there. Um, but that, that misses all the stuff in sysnet. Yeah, but I'm saying if you started there, and then see, even like, that is probably as problem as problem. As Sorry, problem. When I say the CSI main CSIS, yeah. Um, oh. I'm saying that's supposed to be more of the generic everything. But yeah, you would think that. Content, right? it's, it's supposed to be. <laughs> it's supposed to be, but it doesn't necessarily. This is something that's not machine specific. It doesn't have yeah. some other subject to go into. Right. It's not the same thing as. Like generic, like it's yeah, not well, the same thing. It's much more about what if you, you tied to sysis and sysnet stuff and saying, you know, this is stuff that you should be from. I think it would be useful to do a science experiment to see, to construct it and then see how many merges on like 12 would have flattened. Right. And, yeah. to, to, to start getting a sense of what the false positive rate yeah. would be yeah. right. and then use that as tuning because there's probably, well, there may be a few, and, and you'll have to. Ideally, it protects KBI changes that were done right, so you might want to. But ideally, you shouldn't have very many things that it flags if it's a correct signal. If it flags a lot of them, then it's probably too much. Yeah. And that would be a good way to just to, to check. Because in truth, we actually are mostly pretty good about not doing it. Yeah. Right. Because I would expect things like um, some of the other directories and process would probably be. Well, it, it's becoming more complex if we move more k type stuff out to ports as well. Not only 
yeah. barely. I mean, graphics is just going to lose. We've, we've, we've ensured that. Like, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the, well, that's part of why I do. I've done the crap to make it so that even a port can install source that you have built with your kernel. Because that is, to me, the only way that makes that safe. Okay, so are you going to do the science experiment? Who? Me? I'm, I'm looking at Steve and Simon. So it, it's, correct me if I'm wrong, John, but it sounds like if you do the experiments and you come up with a mechanism with a low false positive rate, then the project would consider yeah. uh, employment? Well, and yes, it's especially a good first step. I think just doing the science experiment and figuring out what gives you a low versus not positive rate will already be pretty educational. Yeah. All right. Um, Sanity checks on the stable branch, and if you detect a break, you revert, and you know, right. no, nobody's going to try too much. Uh, but we're not there. So. Yeah. Um, in the few minutes we have left, I thought it'd be good to uh, just end with some quick context, what I call context sharing. Um, sorry, I'm putting in some uh, Netflix terminology. Um, so first of all, I wanted to uh, point out the fact there is a weekly or bi-weekly uh, call of people that are working in the transport space. Uh, it's generally kind of focused on like IP and up, let's say. Um, uh, it's not a bad place to come with more general networking topics if there's not a better group that meets. Um, but uh, a lot of the time is spent in kind of the IP, IPv6, and above layer. Um, it meets every other week. We, uh, for a long time, we were meeting uh, in like the, the morning California time, afternoon East Coast time. Um, that was late for folks in Europe. It was uh, middle of the night for folks in Australia. So we tried, uh, uh, we tried changing our timing. Uh, and so for a couple months, we did. Um, I forget, how, I forget how we moved it. We moved, I think we moved it to the late afternoon East Coast time so that it would be reasonable time in Australia. Uh, and uh, it was even later for folks in Europe. Uh, and now we're doing it at a nice time for the folks in Europe, uh, the morning for the folks in the East Coast, and like 7 a.m. for the folks in California, uh, and still the middle of the night for Australia. Sorry. Uh, but the, uh, the plan is to move it again in four or five months or so. Um, so basically when daylight savings time switches again, we'll, we'll find a new time and uh, uh, change who feels the pain um, of when the call meets. Uh, I put a link to the notes that we keep from the meetings in the agenda, so feel free to look at that. Uh, and feel free to stop by. Uh, if you need a invite to come to the meeting, um, send me an email and I will forward the invite to you. Or find someone else you think attends the meeting and have them forward you the invite. Um, and uh, you know, you're, you're all welcome to come and participate. The yeah, meeting but. tool is, what are you meeting in? We use Google Meet. Okay. Uh, there's a, uh, it seems to generally work in most web browsers and there's applications for many smartphones if you know your web browser doesn't work for you. So it, 
it seems to be a pretty uh, seems to be one of the meeting tools with the low bar to entry. You do? Yes. Okay. Bjorn says you need IPv4. I'm very surprised, actually. You, you can show me see everyone, but you don't see video or audio, which was good because otherwise, after the third time, you'll be connecting with the third man swearing. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why you had to reconnect so many times. Yes. Interesting. You, you get kicked out. There's a technical problem. Please try to reconnect with the community. Interesting. Um, I thought it might be good just to uh, provide an opportunity also for anyone else that's working on things. There's been a set of people that have said what they're working on. Um, if there's anyone else who's working on things that you want to share with everyone else, now is a good time to do that. Let people know what you're working on. Stack an IFL on top of an IFL, that might solve that problem. <laughs> it may. Um, it's probably not how the first guy's going to look. I'm not going to bite that off as a that word. Let me just be clear. <laughs> if, you know, anyone else could use this as a motivating argument for other related work um, as they may see fit, uh, but not in my pen um, right now. Uh, there's some, um, what else? There, there may be. Uh, you know, the conversion of the BMX driver to if lib came out of this this thread where there may be a conversion of the HN driver, which I don't know, I could read the code is a very special piece in a way I don't know where it works. Um to if lib at some point that's not for sure yet. I mean it may have a title. Um and there's also going to be uh, I think a little bit of an extension to the um, the recent patch to if lib that Do you attend these little meetings? Uh, I do, I missed the last one. Um, 
Which speed of the list would you suggest? At least I have developers, if not, I'll be more confident. I think it should at least go out and developers. If so, we should probably just produce a list of all the working groups we have. Because it's consistent. We'll get voluminous, because now we already have at least five or six groups posting minutes there. I think we should just send out a reminder like once every six months or a year or something saying here's the working group. So if you want to join, go look at this wiki page. Now Rocket Transport, I think, has started using it. Um, no, yeah, but yeah. yeah. Okay. So that, that's one of your projects, is you're working to yeah. make a before the future possible. Yeah, it's not just the compiled scientists to Okay. Because eventually there's going to be plenty of the process Something that's slightly smarter than that. So should we call it if problem then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because it has a very specific meaning in 
Yeah. I didn't name it. I didn't name it. Um, <laughs> uh, one where I work at where I was, I can't remember if they're actually working on bridge. Oh, so I might have said they're working on bridge, but I'm not sure. I feel like it's more about dealing with finding alternatives like Vail and PTDAT in order to not copy things in and out of kernel go between VMs. It's new like Sure, Red IPC, all these are based anyway. Oh, that's a really good answer to the question. Yeah. It's a, I think we, we're asking without the record and answer. Yeah, that one is, well, yeah. It depends on the problem. There may be someone who's kind of working on a problem like that. All right. Well, we're, um, we're basically out of time, so is there any uh, last things we should talk about before uh, we quit? Anything pressing on anyone's mind? Pizza! All right. <laughs> All right. I, uh, I guess we're finished then. You can look for the notes online. Thank you for coming. Um, if anyone wants to volunteer to do this next year, I'd be very happy. Um, so <laughs> feel free to. Uh, so if someone wants to volunteer to do this next year, um, send an email to uh, John and Gordon and me and the Dev Summit and whoever else, and uh, make sure everyone knows you want to do this. Otherwise, I'll next year. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Me or He said yes. Oh, sure.